Today on Capitol Hill, the country's energy policy and the rising cost of oil prices were the focus of a House government reform hearing. Clinton administration officials, including Energy Secretary Bill Richardson and EPA Administrator Carol Browner, were among those testifying about whether or not to tap into the nation's emergency supply of oil in order to ease the current situation. This is just over three and a half hours. The committee will come to order. We're expecting other members here shortly, but it's because of the time constraints uh, that uh, Secretary Richardson and uh, Ms. Browner have today, as well as uh, Mr. Hacker. Is that how they pronounce it, Mr. Hacker? Thank you for being here. Uh, we uh, will go ahead and get started. And I'll start off by letting uh, my distinguished senior colleague from the International Relations Committee, Mr. Gilman, make an opening statement. Well, I want to thank you, Chairman Burton, for this series of hearings on this oil crisis. It's affecting all of our region, but particularly the Northeast region. And uh, I want to thank our witnesses, uh, uh, Chairman Richardson, our Secretary of the Department of Energy, uh, uh, our Administrator Carol Bronner of the Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, James Hocker, Chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It's so good you're willing to come and share with us some of your thoughts and how we can best resolve this crisis. Uh, I just mentioned to uh, uh, Secretary Richardson, uh, the, I just left a meeting with the uh, Vice Minister of uh, Energy uh, in Venezuela, who's offered to be of help. And I know that our uh, Secretary of Energy has been meeting with some of the other OPEC nations. Uh, we too in our International Relations Committee are having bilateral meetings uh, with our OPEC nations, trying to convince them that this is not the way to keep goodwill between our nation and their oil-producing uh, activities. Uh, their manipulation of the market certainly has not helped our economy, nor our consumers, nor our industry. And we hope we can finally convince them to open the spigot so that we're not going to be confronted with all of these problems. Uh, Energy Secretary Bill Richardson testified before our committee and told us about his uh, diploma, diplomatic efforts, and we hope that they will produce results, and we look forward to hearing. And last winter, we were told that the increase in the cost of fuel was a result of the heavy winter, and over the past few months, the administration told us that the prices of fuel went up due to increased travel, the summer, and a host of other reasons. I think what we need most for the American people right now is a strategic, forward-looking energy policy that will take into account that our seasons are not natural disasters, but something that occurs every year and is something that we can, should be planning for. In the short-term energy outlook for September, uh, the Energy Information Agency reported that unless the winter in the Northeast is unusually mild and or uh, uh, world crude oil prices collapse. Substantial price strength gains for heating oil and diesel fuel oil are, are uh, highly likely. Once again, it appears that Mother Nature has been dictating the energy policy for the administration rather than our administration being proactive and creating and implementing both a short and long-term energy policy that takes winter weather into consideration and plans for it rather than hoping for a mild winter. So we welcome having our secretaries here and our administrator here. And Mr. Chairman, I again want to thank you and, uh, Chair and Ranking Minority Member Waxman for conducting this series of hearings. Thank you, Chairman Gilman. Uh, let me start with the official business besides your opening statement and say a quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order and I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that questioning in this matter proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to members as the committee, of the committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes equally divided between the majority and minority, and without objection, so ordered. Today, uh, we uh, return for our third day of hearings on problems in our energy markets. Before I, I, I get into my statement too much, 
Miss Browner told me that her father, Michael Browner, here is here today, and I wanted to acknowledge him. He's from Limerick, Ireland, and now lives in Florida. Where are you, sir? Just wanted to recognize you and, and let you know we, we love Ireland. And uh, we welcome you to the good old USA. I guess you've been here for a while, though. Anyhow, we're happy to have before us uh, the Secretary of Energy, Mr. Richardson, and uh, Ms. Browner, the head of the EPA. We welcome you both back. You've been here before. We also have the Chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Mr. Hecker. Got that right that time. And this is the first time you've been before us, and we welcome you. Energy prices are soaring all around us. Gasoline, home heating oil, natural gas, electricity. We're seeing disruptions in supply, and it seems like fires are erupting faster than we can put them out. If this situation continues, every American family across the country is going to feel the impact this winter and next summer. No one is going to be immune. Yesterday, I spent some time talking about some of the early warning signs we're seeing, but it's worth taking another look. This summer, the price of reformulated gasoline shot up to over $2 a barrel in the Midwest. Last winter, the price of home heating oil more than doubled in New England and the Northeast. This fall, inventories are at a five-year low. Prices are so high that distributors are going into the winter with empty storage tanks. The price of crude oil is now closing in on $40 a barrel. At the be beginning of last year, it was $10 a barrel, almost a 400% increase. The price of natural gas has tripled since last spring. In Montana, electricity rates have gone up 500% for industrial users. We heard yesterday from a businessman who had to shut down his business and lay off 300 people simply because they could not pay their electric bills. In San Diego, California, electricity rates have tripled. Week after week, the state of California has to turn off the power to many of its large customers to keep the whole grid from crashing. These problems are mounting one on top of another, and we've seen no energy policy long-term from this administration. What's the administration going to do to help bring natural gas prices down? What's this administration going to do to stop gasoline and home heating oil price spikes? What's the administration going to do to help restore stability to our electricity grid? We need to deal with these problems, and we have to have an energy policy, and we have to have it right now. The administration simply doesn't have one. Senior citizens living on fixed incomes cannot afford to see their electric bills double or triple now or this winter. Low-income families can't afford to pay twice as much to heat their homes. They simply can't do it. We have some fundamental problems with our energy markets. There are supply and demand problems. Demand keeps growing, but supply is simply not keeping up. Oil refineries and electricity generators, our transmission systems are practically bursting at the seams. All it takes is one small disruption to put the entire system into a tailspin and send prices soaring. We saw that this past summer in Chicago. Yesterday, we heard from professionals in the energy business. We asked them about the obstacles that they face, why they're having trouble keeping up with demand. In almost every instance, the story was the same, government overregulation. In some cases, it's state and local laws that create the problem. In many cases, it's the federal government and federal regulations. We talked to a home heating oil distributor from New England. He told us, first of all, that prices are so high that distributors can't fill their storage tanks to get ready for the winter. They're going into the winter with empty tanks. But he also told us one of the strangest stories of red tape run amok that I've ever heard, and I've heard quite a few. He brought with him four little bottles, and I want to show you these bottles here. They're different colors, as you can see. Four little bottles of diesel fuel. They're all different colors. And I asked him to leave the bottles with me so I could put them on display and ask you about them. The federal government makes the dealer dye these fuels different colors and store them in different tanks, thus necessitating more expenditures for tanks. The two red ones are complements of the Treasury Department. They're apparently for off-road use. The Treasury Department makes the dealers dye them different shades of red to make sure that no one cheats on their excise taxes. The two clear ones are complements of the EPA. The EPA makes the dealers store them in separate tanks because they have slight differences in their sulfur levels. 
Dealers have a dwindling number of storage tanks because it isn't economical to build them anymore. At the same time, they have to subdivide the tanks that they do have to hold these four different colored levels, or fuels. They have to have different trucks to haul the different colors, and the kicker is this, they're all practically the same fuel. The differences are very small. I probably didn't explain all that very well. I've had it explained to me three or four times yesterday, but I'm still not sure how, that I get it. I do know this much. It's one of the more bizarre stories of government run amok that I've heard. At a time that they're facing a market that's been turned on its head, these dealers should not have to deal with this kind of nonsense. Now, that's a fairly small problem. The problems that the gasoline industry is facing are much more serious. Under the Clean Air Act and other federal regulations, it's impossible to build a new refinery in America. It hasn't been done in 25 years. In 1982, there were 231 refineries in the United States. Today, that's been reduced from 231 to 155. Yet at the same time, refiners have to make as many as 15 different blends of gasoline to comply with the reformulated gas rules during the summertime. So on the one hand, they can't expand their capacity to keep up with demand, and on the other hand, the federal government is placing all of these additional demands for specialty fuels on them. We have a chart here, and can you put that chart up? We have a chart here uh, of all the different fuels Sitco has to make in one region. Can we put that up on the monitors? Do we have that uh, for the monitors? That's the only one we have on the big poster, so I'll draw your attention to the poster over there that they're having trouble put up on the, putting up on the easel. You can see the different colors. Their refineries are being stretched to the limit. Under those circumstances, all it takes is one little disruption to bring the whole system down, and that's what happened in Chicago and Milwaukee this summer, and it's going to happen again unless we make some changes. But that's not all. We're told yesterday that the EPA has a raft of new regulations for gasoline and diesel fuel in the works. They're going to take effect in the next few years. Industry is telling them that if they're hit with these new restrictions in such a short time period, it's going to overload the system. It's going to disrupt fuel supplies. Consumers are going to be hurt, but apparently not many people are paying any attention. When I say that we don't have a serious energy policy in this country, that's exactly what we're talking about. Industry has offered solutions that would bring about dramatic reductions in sulfur and other pollutants, but that wouldn't disrupt supply. The EPA apparently isn't interested. That's something an IAN members want to talk to both Ms. Browner and Mr. Richardson about today. Yesterday we heard from an executive who builds electric power plants. His company is building a state-of-the-art facility in California. It sailed through the permit process. But under EPA rules, all it takes is one person to file an appeal, and the whole process is brought to a screeching halt. One person who lived over 100 miles away from this particular site filed an appeal, and the project was shut down for more than four months. By the time, and, and I want to tell you, the Sierra Club and everybody else was for the project, there, and, and, and evidently you were, but the regulation that was in place allowed this one person to shut it down for four months, and it's put an extremely large strain on California. And uh, the people in California are now asking them to work double shifts to get that, uh, that uh, generating capacity online. And they're, they're trying to do it, obviously, to keep from avoiding some more blackouts uh, uh, now and in the future. Ironically, the EPA has been working on new rules to streamline the appeals process and weed out frivolous appeals since 1992. The new rules still haven't taken effect. Now, these are just a few examples of areas where the government can exercise a little common sense to help solve some of these problems. But it isn't happening. Nobody's saying, nobody's saying we should appeal the Clean Air Act. Nobody's saying we should roll back the clock. But how about just a little more flexibility with, for some of these industries as we move forward? These problems aren't going to go away by themselves. The Energy Information Administration projects that natural gas prices will go up another 23% this winter over current prices. They estimate that home heating oil will go up another 31% this winter. When families are seeing their electricity bills tripling and when businesses are laying people off because they can't pay their energy bills, something has to be done. 
If we don't develop a tough energy policy and stick to it, we're just going to keep lurching from one crisis to another. The bottom line is this. We can't bury our heads in the sand anymore. We have a strong energy policy. If we have to have a strong energy policy. Under this administration, we have not, unfortunately, had a strong energy policy, and we've suffered for the past eight years. We need a policy that will help us become more self-sufficient. We have enormous deposits of oil and gas that are off limits, and I'm going to ask questions about that in a few minutes. We have sites in the United States that have, we have been told by experts yesterday and before that have tremendous deposits of natural gas and oil that could be drilled in an environmentally safe way, and they're off limits. We can't get to them. And with all that, those reserves, some of them 50, 60, 70 years of reserves, it seems to me that we ought to take another look at that. We need to re review some of these new EPA rules coming down the pike to see if there's some flexibility that could be put in order. And uh, I want to say once again to Secretary Richardson and Ms. Browner and Mr. Hacker, 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 excuse me, I'll get that right, uh, that we really appreciate you being here. We have a lot of questions, and I look forward to hearing your answer. And I understand that uh, Secretary Richardson's under time constraints will try to meet his time constraints so that he can get to other business that he has to do. But I do want to afford my colleagues as much time as possible for questions. So we'll ask you for your opening remarks. We'll start with you, Secretary Richardson. Mr. Chairman, may I ask permission to insert my full opening statement in the record? Sir? Yes, that's fine. Uh, do other members have uh, opening statements real quickly? They'd, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Waxman. Of course you have one. And then I'll ask other members if they, if they don't have an urgent need for opening statements to put those in the record. But if they do have opening statements they want to make, will accede to their wishes. Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we had a hearing yesterday, and at that hearing, uh, uh, I said that uh, we are looking at a topic that's been neglected by the Congress for too long, and that's the topic of an energy policy. I learned yesterday that there's a bipartisan agreement that our nation faces serious energy problems. Members on both sides are worried about the impacts of high energy prices on our constituents. And there's certainly grounds for concern. The price of crude oil has risen dramatically over the past year. Last winter in the Northeast, the cost of heating a home with oil soared, and prices could be even higher this year. And this summer in California, consumers in San Diego have faced electricity bills that are two to three times higher than normal, and other areas of the state have experienced brownouts. Unfortunately, I also learned yesterday that there's no bipartisan agreement about the causes of these problems and how we should address them. Chairman Burton and other Republican leaders blame the policies of the Clinton administration. Some even claim that the Clean Air Act, one of our nation's most successful environmental laws, is the cause of soaring energy prices. We had one executive from an oil company tell us yesterday that we ought to just let them drill off the coasts of our nation and set up oil wells, and that would solve our problem. These theories make, may make uh, uh, for good politics, but they're basically nonsense. The fundamental problem that our nation faces is that we are too dependent on fossil fuels in general and oil in particular. This leaves us vulnerable to manipulation by OPEC and threatens our economic and national security. And as we enter the 21st century, we are also burdened with an antiquated electric utility infrastructure. Now, these are not new problems. Gas lines in the 1970s showed us the dangers of excessive reliance on oil. But a combination of factors, lower energy prices, anti-regulatory sentiment in the administration in the 1980s and in the Congress in the 1990s, and a growing economy have conspired to halt our progress towards alternative fuels, renewable energy, and energy independence. In fact, we consume more oil, more gasoline, and more diesel fuel today than we did 20 years ago. The Clinton administration has proposed modest steps to reduce our dependence on oil and other fossil fuels. The administration has proposed tax credits to spur energy efficiency and research and development partnerships with the auto industry to develop a new generation of clean vehicles. 
and the administration has sent Congress electricity restructuring legislation. But even these needed measures have met resistance in the Congress. As a result, we haven't formulated or implemented the kind of comprehensive energy policy our nation needs. The last time Congress enacted a comprehensive uh, piece of energy legislation was 1992. In recent years, the Republican leadership in Congress has even gone so far as to call for the abolition of the Department of Energy and the sale of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The states, too, have made mistakes. With hindsight, the deregulation efforts in California may have serious flaws, allowing energy suppliers to manipulate the market and raise prices through the roof. But while we face serious problems today, the future could be much brighter. Our energy policy may have stagnated, but te technology hasn't. New energy technologies are on the horizon that can strengthen our economy protect our environment, and lessen our dependence on oil and other fossil fuels. Fuel cells, for instance, have made enormous strides in recent years. This technology combines hydrogen with oxygen via an electrochemical process to generate electricity without emitting any air pollution or greenhouse gases. The costs of this technology are dropping, and <laughs> prototypes have been developed that can run automobiles or light buildings. And since fuel cells do not have to run off of gasoline, they can reduce our dependence on foreign oil. I'd also like to point out that distributed, uh, that the distributed generation with fuel cells avoids the need to construct high voltage transmission lines that are often difficult to site and costly to build. It won't be easy to shift course. We learned yesterday that Big oil and gas companies are making billions off of today's high prices. And they hire countless lobbyists and give millions in campaign contributions to preserve the status quo. But if we have the political will, we can craft a sound energy policy for our children, one that relies on new technologies, energy efficiency, and renewable energy to create new industries and jobs, provide greater energy independence, and protect the global environment. The energy crisis of the 1970s showed us the importance of developing forward-looking energy policies, but unfortunately we squandered that opportunity to reduce our dependence on oil and implement needed changes in U.S. energy policy. I hope we won't re repeat that mistake again. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, do other members have uh, opening statements that they feel they want to make? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I beg your pardon. I mean, I'd be happy to enter mine into the record if, if it's agreeable to the other side to do all such statements, so we can get well, to the witnesses. Well, I, I, I always like to allow members to make opening statements if they choose to do so. The only problem is that Mr. Richardson and Ms. Browner, I think, are under some time constraints, and I'd like to get to questioning as soon as possible. But if you have an opening statement you want to make, and you feel well, I, I'd be happy to submit mine, submit mine to the record for the in the, in the interest of time. Okay, so. without objection, so order. Anyone else uh, have an opening statement? Mr. Kucinich? I, I have an opening statement, and I'll submit it for the record. I'd just like to, uh, uh, to say this, though. I represent Cleveland, and one of the things that's happening in our area is that the uh, price of natural gas has gone up three times in a year. And when we look at the supply of natural gas, it's, it seems to have, uh, there seems to be some real questions because uh, I think all of us remember that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission presided over the deregulation of natural gas wholesale rates. And we're now experiencing a steep rise in natural gas prices even before families are turning on the heat. Uh, uh, we're also seeing the use of certain market mechanisms by natural gas companies uh, where they're now offering long-term contracts at reduced rates and variable rates to their customers while they're, they're asserting questions of whether they have an adequate supply uh, the demand remains constant, the price goes up. In some cases, demand has even exceeded that. The question I, have, the question I hope to see answered in this hearing is, um, you know, what are people supposed to do when it looks like uh, government is not adequately responding? The, the prices keep going up and up. I'm hopeful that we're going to see uh, addressed in this hearing 
the question as to whether or not this free market approach that's been taken has its limits. Because, you know, whether we're talking, there's, there's programs in place for low-income people. But what about middle-income people who are going to see their whole way of, of living under attack with, uh, and, and working people are going to see their whole way of living under, under attack with these sharp price increases? And can government just afford to stand on the sidelines and let the, uh, the natural gas companies and the oil companies charge whatever they want? I hope not. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. No, I'll pass. I'd like to give the witnesses a chance. Thank you. What we'll do is we'll try to... Con <laughs> Mr. Kowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank Administrator Browner during the time that the Midwest was suffering for, from differentially high gasoline prices this summer. Your responsiveness to us and your effectiveness in helping initiate an FTC investigation, and some may argue otherwise, but I do believe that the initiation of that investigation itself help to bring prices at, in line, at least, with the rest of the nation as high as they may be. And to Secretary Richardson for your responsiveness, too. We had a, a meeting of our um, uh, energy task force with you and your willingness to say that everything is on the table. And, uh, and to the Vice President for the initiation yesterday of the proposals, the concrete proposals that that, uh, that he made. In, in Illinois, too, um, we're seeing gas prices at un, natural gas prices at unprecedented levels in July. They told us that last year's bill of $410 would be $610 this year. They've revised that upward to $750 this year for the same amount of gas last year, costing $410. But final, just a, a couple of sentences. You know, if we want to point fingers, I wasn't here when we deregulated natural gas, but I was organizing around this issue with lots of consumers who were very concerned about it. It seems to me now that we are reaping the rewards of, of some of that and that if we want to point fingers, we should look at big oil and big gas and say, how come at a time when anyone could predict shortages that we were seeing a decrease in production and remarkably a dramatic increase in profits? I mean, I think that we need to take steps as the, the government, but it hasn't been for lack of trying. And I think now that we move up more aggressively forward, that's important. But I think we need to question big oil and big gas about their role. Thank you. Mr. Sanders, or did you, did you, Mr. Sanders. I would concur with what Mr. Uh, Kowski. Excuse me, just one second, Mr. Sanders. It is the intent of the uh, chairman to go ahead with the hearing and have Mr. Shays take over the chair when he comes back. So if people want to go vote and come back to expedite uh, the hearing, it, it would be all right. Okay, I'll be very brief. Uh, number one, I want to thank our guests for being here and thank both of them for the excellent work they're doing. Thank Mr. Richardson for meeting with the New England delegation yesterday and Ms. Browner for the outstanding work she's done for so many years. I just want to inform both of them uh, that they may or may not know that over well over 100 members of Congress uh, from both parties uh, sent a letter to the president and congressional leaders outlining six basic points uh, that we would like to see action on and action on immediately. Number one, Mr. Richardson, thank you for your efforts in moving the Northeast Home Heating Oil Reserve forward. Uh, that's a request that we made to you last year, and the administration has moved actively on that. I know that you need now authorization from the Senate so that there can be a trigger mechanism so that the President, in fact, can release that oil, and we've got to give that to the President. Number two, we must release oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We've discussed that at great length. We have close to 600 million barrels uh, sitting out there. There is an emergency. Middle class, working families, elderly people cannot afford to see prices go higher and higher. Let us release some of that oil. That is why it's there. Thirdly, I believe the administration has got to be more vigorous in negotiating with OPEC. Americans lost lives bringing the Kuwaiti ruling family back into power, defending Saudi Arabia. They cannot turn their back on us at a time of need and cut back production. Fourthly, with soaring prices, there must be a significant increase in LIHEAP funding, and the President must release as soon as possible a substantial amount of emergency LIHEAP money so the people have the opportunity of buying oil before prices really hit the roof. Fifth, we all agree 
that we need to be much more vigorous long-term energy conservation. We're more dependent on the Mideast now than we were 25 years ago. Uh, Ms. Browner, you and I discussed this a couple of months ago. Vermont is beginning to try to do something. We can significantly lower the amount of energy that we are, are utilizing in this country. It's an outrage that we're not. Let's go forward in those areas. We should give you the tools. You should be vigorous in expounding that. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Uh, Mr. Richardson, do you have an opening statement? Uh, first of all, let me, we have a custom here of swearing in our witness. Would you please rise? Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so you got. Mr. Richardson? Secretary Richardson, excuse me. <laughs> Chairman Burton, I want to thank you for the responsiveness and graciousness that you have undertaken with my schedule today, and I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, our energy policy is based on market forces, not market making, on diversity of supply and robust diplomatic relations with energy producing countries. It's based on improving production and use of traditional fuels through new technology. It's based on diversity of energy sources with broad investment in alternative fuels and energy sources. It's based on increasing energy efficiency. And lastly, in preserving and fortifying our insurance policy against supply interruption, and that is our strategic petroleum reserve. Mr. Chairman, we've published two statements of our national energy policy in the past few years. Uh, these documents serve as blueprints for our energy policies that we have put forward by the administration. What we need now is a bipartisan energy policy to deal with the problems that many of you so ably outlined. The main problem we have is volatility. Mr. Chairman, we need such overarching policies, especially today in the past year, what we have seen is substantial volatility in our energy markets. We've endured supply and price problems in heating oil, in gasoline, and in electricity. The year has not seen a season go by without an energy challenge. Every region of the country has shared in the increase in crude oil prices, and many regions have experienced specific problems on energy supplies. It is essential that we recognize the importance of integrated diverse energy supply and demand policies. Let me also state, Mr. Chairman, that this robust economy in the last seven years, energy demand in this country partially because of the robust economy, has increased 14 percent. This has been an important factor. With oil and gas markets, as you know, as part of the administration's efforts to address market imbalances, I've talked extensively with oil-producing nations. OPEC and other producers have heard our concerns and have boosted their output three times, with the most recent increases to come online in October. Our latest data shows that there are about 3.5 million barrels per day more oil on the market than at this time last year. That is a significant addition to the world market. And according to the Energy Department's Energy Information Administration, the latest addition of 800,000 barrels per day, along with boosted production from non-OPEC producers, should enable the oil industry to finally begin rebuilding global stocks, which has also been a problem. I say finally because while more oil has come into the markets over the past year, demand has grown much faster than anticipated, as I said, increasing by 14 percent in recent years. And as demand has absorbed additional supply from the market, the oil industry has been enabled to refurbish stocks, even with, for example, U.S. refiners working at 96 percent of capacity. These factors have combined to result in a number of price increases across the range of petroleum products. We see this in the crude market, which closed yesterday at $37.20, one of the highest prices in a decade. We are seeing this at the gas pump, where drivers are paying an average of $1.56 per gallon, up over 30 cents from last year, but down 12 cents from this past June when you held your hearing. And with distillate reserves already at levels far lower than usual for this time of year, about 20 percent below last year, we're facing, for the, we're, we're facing the potential for another heating oil shortfall. The administration is taking steps to meet these energy challenges. Most notably, the administration took the step of creating 
a 2 million barrel northeast heating oil reserve to be used to augment supplies if they are needed. Sites have already been chosen and contracts for the oil were let last month, and oil is coming into the reserve. Mr. Chairman, let me be clear that we need the Congress to approve a reasonable trigger for releasing the heating oil in the reserve, as well as the funding to continue the reserve beyond this winter. That hasn't happened yet. We also continue to examine the option of swapping oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve if the oil supply and supply conditions warrant it. We have renegotiated oil delivery schedules for the Spro's Royal Defill Program so that millions of barrels of oil go into the market instead. Mr. Chairman, again, let me remind you that Congress has delayed action to extend the Energy Policy and Conservation Act which authorizes the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and America's participation in the International Energy Agency. We need to get that work done. The administration has taken other aggressive measures. You will recall that to help American families heat their homes last winter, the President released all emergency low-income energy assistance funds available for the year. He also asked Congress for $600 million more to replenish the reserve, funds which were just approved in July. Still, the House and Senate have underfunded our FY2001 request for weatherization assistance. Mr. Chairman, we have found this to be an effective way for families to lessen their demand for heating oil and electricity and in turn lessen their winter energy bills. We need to have this critical relief increased in conference. We also reestablish an Office of Energy Emergencies at our department to coordinate with the states and other federal agencies regarding energy-related crises. This helped us during the summer when electricity demand was high. We addressed the issue of supply through increased support for tankers, small business loans for distributors, and other small businesses impacted by high prices, and encouraged refiners to increase production. We have some budget needs. Mr. Chairman, we, we have these needs, and they are a priority. As I mentioned to you before, We've worked hard to escalate domestic production of oil, to cultivate alternative sources of energy, and amplify energy efficiency, especially in transportation. In fact, thanks to our vigorous research and development efforts, we've taken recent strides on this latter point, strides that will help reduce our dependence on foreign oil, continue to lessen pollution, and keep our economic engine humming at home and in the world marketplace. For example, a major milestone is the partnership for a new generation of vehicles where recently we have automakers unveiling three concept cars which may reach 80 miles per gallon in three or four years. At the department, we just announced the third and final part of our heavy vehicle truck research program, high efficiency clean diesel engines for 18 wheelers whose drivers have been hit hard by high oil prices. And a research project was recently launched with a heavy duty vehicle industry to develop more energy efficient trucks over the next five years from pickups and SUVs to 18-wheelers. As you know, Mr. Chairman, we're accelerating work in natural gas, which has emerged as a competitive and critical fossil energy resource. Our Energy Information Administration forecasts that demand for natural gas will grow by more than 4 percent in just one year. So this is what we're doing, working with the Interior Department and other agencies on simplifying access to public lands. We have an interagency working group meeting at the White House to pursue proposals on access to natural gas. The administration is working to streamline environmental review processes, develop regional assessments of oil and gas resources, and advance technologies to produce on federal lands. Mr. President, in March, the President proposed tax incentives for oil and gas production, delayed expense of what is called G&G &G expensing, which is more drilling for natural gas. We need your support so that we can do even more to get this relief to consumers. Earlier this year, the President sent a letter to the Majority Leader of the Senate urging the Congress to work with the administration to enact the President's pending energy proposals as soon as possible. One chief component of the President's energy initiative is the $4 billion tax package of tax incentives to encourage domestic oil and gas production and for consumers to purchase more efficient cars, homes, and consumer product, products. While this package contains a number of viable solutions to our current challenges, solutions to be found right here in the United States, Mr. Chairman, the proposal has been idle in the Congress for more than two years. The President has also repeatedly asked for increased investments to meet our energy needs. In FY 2001, the President advanced a $1.4 billion investment 
in energy department programs and energy efficiency, renewable energy, natural gas, distributed power systems. But still the Congress has not backed these investments, approving just 12 percent of the increase over the last seven years. Mr. Chairman, this simply is not acceptable. And right now, the President is requesting an additional $19 million from Congress for low-income home weatherization, funds which were not included in the Supplemental Appropriations Act. On electricity restructuring, I'd like to finish by expressing to you how disappointed I am that it appears Congress will adjourn without acting on electricity legislation, which Mr. Waxman mentioned. The President submitted comprehensive electricity restructuring legislation to Congress two years ago. Unfortunately, the 106th Congress has failed to act on this or any other piece of electricity legislation, and you yourself mentioned the problems we are having with our electricity grid. Mr. Chairman, the Congress' inability to adopt restructuring legislation has helped produce some of the difficulties seen in electricity markets in some parts of the country. Over the last several summers, some utilities struggled to meet demand. They were forced to cut off interruptible customers and plead consumers and businesses to conserve energy. In some instances, they were forced to implement rolling blackouts to avoid complete collapse. Mr. Chairman, as in our oil markets, unparalleled economic growth has spawned burgeoning demand that outstrips supply. And I know Chairman Hecker is an expert on this issue, and I'm sure he can tell you more. We've seen the price spikes in California, the Pacific Northwest, and parts of New York. Enactment of federal electricity restructuring legislation, as proposed by the administration, along with several bipartisan proposals, would go a long way towards resolving this problem. It would help do so by establishing a federal rules of the road, where generating companies have the certainty they need on whether to invest in new power plants and transmission facilities. Moreover, our bill would help produce a more efficient interstate transmission system to enable the free flow of power to where it is needed the most. The legislation would also provide a funding source to make up for utility cutbacks and energy efficiency programs. In light of the problems we faced, I would urge the Congress to reconsider its inaction on electricity restructuring. Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for listening and thank you for accommodating our schedule. Well, let me just say before we go to Ms. Browner that uh, uh, we, we asked all of our witnesses to submit their statements to us ahead of time, and unfortunately, I guess you couldn't do that. Uh, you wanted to leave, Mr. Secretary, by 2 o'clock because you have an appointment. Because the statements weren't given to us and because it, they, they take so long, uh, it may necessitate us having another hearing next week because we do have a lot of questions and we really need to get those answers for the American people. And because of the time constraints that you're under today, uh, we may not be able to get that done. And so uh, I wanted to apologize to you in advance because we're going to get the questions answered, and I'm sorry that it's taken this long. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I just want to say uh, uh, maybe Mr. Richardson can stay longer because this is an important hearing, or if we need to, we'll have another one. But we did have a very, very long opening statement by the chair, and I followed him and made an equally long one. Not quite as long, but it is not fair that for the uh, witnesses uh, to have to, where they had to sit through all, all, here, all our openings. But they know Mr. Richardson was in the House. He knows the way it works. So maybe he can stay a little longer because we ought to get those questions asked and answered at this hearing. It's if he can't, maybe we can get him back. That's absolutely correct. So, Ms. Browner, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, it is uh, indeed a pleasure to be back before this committee, and I welcome this opportunity to discuss the administration's belief that protecting the health of the American people is an essential part of good energy policy. This administration's policy is to protect public health and to promote a healthy economy. Uh, we believe that this is clearly achievable. We believe that we have demonstrated it over the last seven and a half years. We have achieved some of the greatest environmental progress in the history of this country in the last seven and a half years. And at the same time, we have grown our economy in unprecedented ways. I think a powerful example of this hand-in-hand -hand relationship between a healthy economy and a healthy environment is provided by the results of the work that this nation has done under the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. 
We are aggressively and sensibly implementing this landmark public health protection statute, which was <coughs> enacted by Congress with bipartisan support and signed into law by then-President Bush. The result of this unprecedented, unprecedented legislation is that we are achieving real public health benefits in ways that are consistent with a healthy economy and take into account the need for reliable energy supplies. Over the past decade, we have made great strides in cleaning the air we breathe while our economy is growing. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, if I might refer you to this chart. This tells an incredible story. Between 1990 and 1999, the nation's gross domestic product increased 32 percent. Fossil fuel consumption increased 13 percent. Vehicle miles traveled. The distance, the miles we are driving our cars increased 30 percent. And at the same time, the aggregate emissions of the six predominant air pollutants decreased by 9 percent. Now, that is a real success story. We are growing our economy. We are using more fuel. We are driving further, and yet our air is getting cleaner. In addition, an unprecedented number of cities have met public health-based national ambient air quality standards since 1991. 39 of the original 42 carbon monoxide areas are now in compliance. 59 of the original 98 ozone areas, 68 of the 85 original fine particle areas, all designated non-attainment meeting standards today, important public health standards. The human health benefits of these emissions reductions required by Congress in the 1990 amendments are dramatic. Uh, the annual benefits in the year 2010, when the law is fully implemented, will include 23,000 fewer incidences of premature death, 20,000 fewer cases of chronic bronchitis, 47,000 fewer cases of acute bronchitis, 22,000 fewer respiratory-related hospital admissions, 42,000 fewer cardiovascular hospital admissions, 4,800 fewer emergency room visits for asthma. The list goes on and on. The public health benefits of cleaning our air are dramatic. They are real. Now, the Clean Air Act recognizes that we cannot meet the public health goals set by that important piece of legislation without reducing air pollution from sources such as coal-fired power plants, gasoline, and diesel fuels. And I think it is important to note that there are many in industry that have done their part, that have risen to these challenges. The utility industry dramatically cut acid rain causing emissions from power plants, while net electricity generation increased 28 percent. Oil refiners were successful in producing cleaner gasoline required by the Clean Air Act, while the amount of gasoline supplied during the 1990s continued a steady increase. Companies such as BP Amico have even gone beyond the legal requirements, committing to produce the new uh, EPA required low sulfur, clean burning gasoline three and four years earlier at current prices. Likewise, a number of our uh, automobile manufacturers agreeing to lower their tailpipe emissions earlier. Why are they doing this? Not just because it's good for the public's health. It is good for the bottom line. It is good for their business. In pursuing the nation's public health goals, EPA takes the issue of adequate energy supplies very seriously. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my written testimony uh, contains a number of specific examples in which EPA has provided regulatory flexibility in energy supply emergencies and has uh, pursued specific actions to reduce peak energy use. In addition, we work with industry and other stakeholders to craft flexible rules that allow for common sense, for cost-effective compliance strategies. Uh, let me just share with you one or two examples. Uh, last year, the President announced our new Tier 2 tailpipe emission standards and low sulfur gasoline requirements. These are reasonable. They are flexible. They are cost-effective. The rule gives refiners substantial lead time on the order of four to five years. For most refiners, the phase-in begins in 2004 and continues through 2000. 
2006. Small refiners get until 2008 and, a, and can apply for some additional time if they can demonstrate a need. Uh, flexibility is also provided through aver uh, annual averaging and trading of credits among refiners and credits for early reductions. Uh, there is a phase-in program for gasoline sold in certain western states. Again, demonstrating that you can both set and meet tough public health standards and provide flexibility to industry in order to meet those standards in a cost-effective manner. We're also promoting a flexible approach for achieving required NOx reductions uh, in the eastern part of the uh, country. These are the uh, NOx uh, problems uh, that travel, the, the NOx that travels uh, that contributes to the regional ozone pollution uh, problems. Um, to further assure reliability, EPA is allowing states uh, to use a credit trading program. We are encouraging them. We would ask Congress to give us some more authority so we can do that more expeditiously. But in the meantime, we are working with states to use what we have learned from the very successful, the very uh, cost-effective asset ring emissions credit trading program and bring that to bear on NOx and other air pollutions. Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, no one is saying that public health protections, pollution reductions are without cost. But reducing pollution is an invaluable investment in the health of our citizens and our environment. Time and time again, our air regulations, we have been able to show the, the costs, uh, the, the benefits far outweigh the cost. For example, the new tailpipe emission cleaner fuel requirements, it is if we are taking 164 million cars off the road, but they're going to be there, each and every one of them. They're just going to be cleaner. They're going to be polluting less. Uh, when we look at the cost of meeting those standards, we estimate that for every $5 invested, we will get $25 back in environmental and health benefits for our families. We estimate that the asset rain program in the year 2010 will have $48 billion in health benefits from reduced particle matters. We're talking about the particles that become embedded in the lungs, particularly of our senior citizens. They can't uh, spit them out. They can't cough them up. can result in premature death. In 1999, EPA completed an extensive congressionally mandated analysis of the cost and benefits of the Clean Air Act of 1990. Although, obviously, any such analysis involves all of the normal economic uncertainties, the central finding is that the benefits of that act, as we have worked to implement that important piece of legislation, have exceeded the cost of meeting environmental standards by a ratio of four to one. Mr. Chairman, if I might, just in my time remaining, highlight some of the opportunities that I believe are available to this Congress to help address energy supply issues. Energy efficiency. Since 1992, EPA and DOE's Energy Star programs have been helping businesses and families select energy efficient products that save money on energy bills while also helping to conserve energy supplies and reduce air pollution at peak periods. Our Energy Star program has eliminated the need for almost 10,000 megawatts of peak summer generating capacity, 10,000 megawatts through energy efficiency. We have also, through this program, saved businesses and consumers more than $4 billion on, the ener on their energy bills, and we have reduced air pollution. Now, Congress has the opportunity to fund this program. Unfortunately, neither the House or the Senate and the EPA appropriations bill has thus far uh, provided the dollars to EPA, which the President has requested a $124 million increase for technologies, uh, for programs like Energy Star, and both the House and the Senate thus far have failed to fund this incredibly cost-effective, sensible, reasonable program. If Congress had fully funded past requests for EPA's Energy Star programs, electricity demand this summer could have been up to 3,000 megawatts lower than it is currently, equivalent to the power output of more than 10 average size power plants. Congress also has the opportunity to promote energy efficiency by supporting the President's request for $85 million for a new Clean Air Partnership Fund. Uh, this has not been included in our appropriations bill thus far. This is an initiative that would provide much-needed dollars to state, 
local governments to work with their businesses to develop innovative energy efficiency strategies, uh, such as uh, investments in clean distributed power sources uh, that do not harm the air their citizens breathe, but do increase power supply. In addition, Mr. Chairman, I would like to renew the administration's call for Congress to expeditiously send to the President comprehensive legislation to phase out the fuel additive MTBE from our cleaner burning gasoline. In June of 1999, Mr. Chairman, EPA's Blue Ribbon Panel concluded that MTBE poses risks to our drinking water. EPA believes that Americans deserve both clean air and clean water, and never one at the expense of the other. We are encouraged, the administration, EPA, is encouraged that the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee has taken action on a bill that is consistent with the legislative principles that we put forward er uh, earlier this year. The current oxygenate requirements in the Clean Air Act should be replaced by a, reflex, by a flexible, renewable fuel standards. This would allow all of us to work together to promote the use of ethanol, uh, to do what we can to uh, drive the market for biofuels, for biomass. We have tremendous opportunity, rice straw, wood uh, waste, other biomass. That can become an important part of our energy supply in this country. Uh, this legislation would not only protect water quality, it is good environmental policy, it is good energy policy, it is good farm policy. In closing, Mr. Chairman, we recognize that fuels, electric power, clean air are, an, are important to economic well-being and the health of the American people. We look forward to working with all members to move forward as we have done in the past, to continue to set the strong public health environmental standards that the citizens of this country demand, to do it in common sense, flexible manners. Man, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, several points have been raised by you, several points were raised uh, yesterday. Um, I look forward to sharing with this committee the rest of the story. I'm sure it is important to all of us that we have a full record of exactly what has happened so that as we move forward, we do so with a base of knowledge. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Mr. Hager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Waxman, and members of the committee. Uh, I want to express my thanks for uh, inviting an energy regulatory perspective to, uh, to this a hearing today, and I commend you for, for holding it. Uh, it is uh, timely, and there is a clear need to publicly examine uh, the current price to consumers of various forms of energy and how we ought to respond to those prices uh, through markets, technology, and public policy. Uh, I have spent much of the past several weeks testifying at or conducting uh, hearings on the challenges uh, we as a nation face in this area. Uh, we have heard stories of genuine hardship uh, coming from high electricity prices in California and the expectation that the price of natural gas will stretch the budgets of many households and businesses this winter. Yesterday I was in Ohio with uh, Governor Taft and Alaska Governor Knowles um, discussing the causes and probable results of the gas deliverability squeeze. Uh, in that case, many of the experts present, me, uh, me included, uh, uh, stated their belief that natural gas reserves were uh, adequate and that gas markets were capable of responding to stabilize uh, natural gas prices at lower levels uh, over the next year. Uh, I should note for the committee that gas markets have produced almost $200 billion in savings uh, for the American consumer since 1985, and I expect this uh, to uh, continue. Uh, electricity markets pose a different set of issues for regulators and other public policymakers. That industry is undergoing a fundamental transition uh, at the moment, uh, uh, there are, uh, it was clear uh, in our hearings in California 
um, that uh, the electricity market there was dramatically out of sync with the needs of the digital economy, the expectations of public policymakers, and most importantly, the economic well-being of average electricity customers in that state and uh, in San Diego in particular. The causes and proposed solutions are complex, um, and they include the dramatic uh, surge in demand growth in California. But it has become clear that the California electricity markets are not competitive during peak periods uh, or periods of peak demand. Uh, and uh, uh, that the efforts of state and federal governments and even private corporations to anticipate and avoid this crisis have simply proven inadequate. Uh, there is plenty of responsibility uh, uh, for this market and its prices to go around. Uh, the FERC, which oversees the wholesale portion of all domestic markets, including California's, uh, has been aggressively investigating the problem and looking for appropriate solutions. If that means devising new ways to thwart market power, uh, we will try to do that. If that means changing market rules and wholesale market structures, uh, then we will do that. If it means imposing stricter controls on the ability of uh, utilities or generators to collect market rates, uh, then we will do that. And if it means making uh, rates uh, subject to refund until we can be reasonably confident markets like California's uh, will get, uh, that Californians rather will get price signals instead of price shocks, uh, then the Commission is likely to move in that direction. In the meantime, uh, we have, in effect, capped wholesale markets in that state. The state of California has fortunately also lifted uh, its restrictions on the ability of utilities uh, to hedge in the market uh, when they buy power uh, and, uh, uh, and has adopted legislation to get retail rates back to normal levels and to expedite the siting of new generation facilities. Uh, I want to assure the committee that the FERC is indeed pursuing a consistent energy policy. It is, in fact, spelled out in our strategic plan. Within the limits of our jurisdiction and within the limits of our role as an independent regulatory agency, the Commission has for many years promoted competitive energy markets. Uh, some call this deregulation. Uh, I don't happen to be one of them. I agree uh, with Congressman Kucinich that there are indeed limits to uh, what uh, free market approaches uh, can obtain. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, lighter handed regulation of energy markets is part of our approach. Uh, monitoring markets uh, to ensure they are competitive, efficient, and fair is another element. A third component is to ensure adequate energy infrastructure, such as natural gas pipelines, consistent with sound environmental practices and environmental law. We believe that this is a recipe for stable prices and energy security in the long run. Uh, and today, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, I believe that the FERC is doing all it can. However, uh, we need Congress's help. Uh, I have long advocated restructuring le legislation that would untie our hands in promoting sound electricity markets. Uh, my recommendations uh, would provide, first, that FERC have jurisdiction over all electric transmission in the country. We don't currently. Secondly, the FERC have oversight of electric reliability. We right now have no such authority. Third, that we have express authority to, cr to promote uh, regional transmission organizations to govern uh, the operation of the bulk power market. And fourth, uh, we want broader FERC authority to remedy market power abuses uh, in energy markets. Currently, that authority is limited. Uh, to that list, I might now add additional FERC authority to retroactively correct extraordinary wealth transfers that can happen when prices 
unexpectedly skyrocket and consumers cannot get out of the way. Uh, we right now do not have that authority either. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you again for inviting me here today. I'll be happy to try and field your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hecker. We'll now go to our questioning. Let me uh, start off by saying that... Uh, Mr. Chairman, may, may I make a request? Uh, we were going to have a half hour each side of the full panel. Why don't we do 15 minutes each side of just Mr. Richardson and see if we can accommodate his schedule and then go back to the other witnesses? Well, uh, even if we did 15 minutes on each side, we wouldn't be able to get through all of our questions that we have today. I think because of the time constraints Mr. Richardson is under, we have no option but to have another hearing and to bring him back. Well, perhaps so, but he is trying to deal with an energy crisis, and I, I think the country would be better off if he were dealing with that than sitting in the hearing answering questions that might be asked now and answered now so we can get on with his job. Mr. Waxman, there's an election coming up. If you become chairman next year, you can run this committee. But right now, you're not chairman. Well, I now, gather I will, what's I will, happening will, is politics to be sure you're chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yeah, uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, we would like to get on. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we would like to get on with the business at hand. Do you have any more comments to slow us down? Mr. Chairman, may I inquire how we're proceeding? We're proceeding under the regular order. Now, is that a half hour each side? That's absolutely correct. So before Democrats can ask a question, you'll go for a half hour, but then we'll have a half hour. Mr. Uh, Mr. Richardson uh, will then depart after their questions, and uh, we will not have an opportunity. Well, is it your hope that he'll depart after your questions so we can't question him? Regular order. Mr. It, Richardson. It appears so. Mr. Richardson. Uh, <laughs> We had 231 oil refineries, and it's declined down to 155 oil refineries. And you said in your opening statement that we are letting market forces dictate the price of oil. When the oil industry people were here yesterday, they said one of the problems that they have is they're operating at, I think, 96 percent of capacity right now. And one of the big problems that they have is because they have not been able to build a new oil refinery in the past 25 years. And as a result, they're limited in the supply they can produce. So I'd like to ask you and Ms. Browner, why is it, and they tell me that they can build oil refineries and gas production facilities that will comply with environmental standards and keep the, inter, uh, keep the uh, ecology uh, in a, a clean. If the restrictions by EPA and the Energy Department are not so restrictive. And so I'd like to ask you, what can we do to get more refineries in place to make sure that the demand is met? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me say that we Turn are your very... Mic on. Our policy is to have a viable refining industry in this country. That's number one. Uh, a number of small refineries have closed in the past decade. Uh, poor economics and other investment problems. Now, we have asked the National Petroleum Council, which is a group of energy executives, uh, to advise the Department of Energy, me, on what we need to do to have a viable refining industry in the country. They're expected to complete a report for us this summer. Now, uh, it is our view Mr. Chairman, that our refining capacity right now is at 96 percent. It's gone up, and we were concerned because it was in the low 90s. It's now 96, some say a little bit more. Uh, total U.S. refining capacity has been expanding and becoming more economically competitive. So what has happened also is new refining capacity is likely to be at existing refineries along mainly the Gulf Coast. So what we're seeing is refining capacity has been added to existing refineries right now. Uh, that is how they've kept pace with demand without building new refineries. Nonetheless, we, we still have, we're watching this very closely and we're looking forward to the industries. Well recommendations. Well, on. the industry was here yesterday, and the indications from the industry was they would like to build new refineries. They would like to increase capacity. 
and they ha they can't do it because of environmental regulations, and uh, and they're very concerned about that. The other thing is, uh, and I wish you'd put up that natural. Do you have a comment, incidentally, Ms. Bronner, about uh, this? I do. I'd, I'd like to respond if the allegation is for some reason uh, public health air pollution standards stand in the way of new refineries. I would like to respond. No, that's not what they said. They said they could reach. They, they could build refineries that were environmentally safe. But that our rules were a problem. Yes. Um, and I'd like to respond to that allegation. All right. May I? Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I'd like to make three points. Uh, one is the same point that Mr. Richardson made, but we'd like to actually use the chart. In the last five years, while the number of individual refineries, facilities, has gone down, the refining capacity of the remaining 155, 160 facilities has actually gone up. Part of the reason it is going up is because we work with them to expand those existing facilities, and we do it in an expedited manner. We do it in conjunction with the states. I'll give you an example. There are currently pending 12 permit applications to expand existing refineries. That's over the last two-year period. Most of those permits, and they are issued by the states with our concurrence, most of those permits have been issued in 12 months. Of the 12 that have been received in the last two years, only five are currently pending. The others have been granted. I'll give you an example. We received one down in Texas on March uh, 2000 of this year. It will be done in the next two to six weeks. We received another one uh, in July. We have asked for more technical information. We will then be moving forward. So we are moving through the permitting process, the expansion that the companies are deciding are best for them. The final point I'd like to make, Mr. Chairman, is we're always open to receive any permit application. We don't decide what the application should be in the first instance. That is up to the companies. They do it no. for a variety of reasons. No. In the last 25 years, not because of the new Clean Air Act, not because of the old Clean Air Act, but because of their business realities, they have chosen not to apply for any new facility ground up, but are rather expanding existing facilities, and we are permitting well, those with all of the public health protections. I know, but the argument that they made, Ms. Browner, was that the environmental regulations that uh, they believe are uh, extraordinary uh, are such that they, uh, they can't do it in a profitable way, and as a result, they haven't been able to build those new refineries. But nevertheless, let me get on to another subject. Supply. Uh, would you put up that chart on the uh, gas reserves? The gas uh, uh, companies, that's it right there. The natural uh, gas uh, producers said that their, their existing wells are producing at lower and lower levels. And they can't meet the demand because uh, uh, those, those wells are producing at lower levels. Now we have, as you can see on that map, several very large gas reserves in the continental United States. And this is in the lower 48. This does not show what we have up in Alaska. But they told us that if they could and they can, in an environmentally clean way, drill these wells and get the oil. They said there's no question about that. So my question is, why is it we're not drilling wells in those areas, uh, uh, which are off limits now because of the EPA? Well, I think three because of the... What? Because of the interior department? Because of interior. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to answer for interior, but I, I do think it would be important to note. Um, and, 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 and natural gas exploration, not home use of natural gas, residential use of gas. That does not require any EPA permit. We are not involved in that process whatsoever. But exploration of natural gas in some instances may require a water pollution or air pollution permit from EPA. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with all respect, I think three of the areas that you are noting up there, if I, I, I'm having a hard time seeing this, but I think three are actually offshore uh, areas, and those obviously bring with them uh, particular issues of particular concerns, particularly to the citizens of those areas, well, uh, to the protection of their get, beaches. Let me get to Mr. Richardson because I'm running out of time since he's in charge of energy policy. The large reserve in the middle of the United States, if you excluded the ones that are offshore, according to the people who were here yesterday, would provide a, a substantial amount of gas over a long period of time, 10, 15 years if we were to drill that, and it could be done in a very safe, environmentally safe way. Why are we not exploring that Mr. area? Mr. Chairman, a lot of that is public lands, uh, mm -hmm. that central area. 
Let me also mention to you, Mr. Chairman, that statistics for natural gas, uh, we have had increase uh, domestic uh, natural gas drilling. We have, I think, a total now of rigs, domestic drilling rigs are almost 800, the highest level in the last 15 years. And we've seen a nearly 60 percent increase in the production of natural gas on federal onshore land since 1992. We did open, uh, I, I don't know if the map reflects that, I can't see that, I can see it though, but we did open the uh, Natural Petroleum Reserve in Alaska to, to gas development, where we have 10 trillion cubic feet. Uh, oil production, no, it's not on the map. Oil, oil production on federal Indian lands accounted for 25 percent of domestic production in 99. But on natural gas, Mr. Chairman, what happens is supply and demand uh, dictate production levels. Well, uh, let me just interrupt because the gas producers yesterday said that, uh, uh, and, and Mr. Hecker may want to answer this too, they said that uh, they have their pipelines uh, full at the present time, I think 96 percent. They're concerned about additional pipelines, number one, and number two, also getting more productive gas wells. And they say that the, the, the source is there. I mean, th there's definitely a, a source of gas. They could do it more efficiently. They said that more wells could be drilled. 800 rigs out there right now simply isn't going to, to meet the demand. There's more wells that can be drilled. And they want to know why, and I do too, if this could be done environmentally safely. We're not doing it. So if you and Mr. Hecker could answer that, I think I'm just about out of time here. Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, add on natural gas. What we have also proposed that it's in the President's package is a tax credit for natural gas drilling. It's called uh, geologic expensing, which, which allows for uh, a better ability for the natural gas people to drill. We think this is very important. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hecker. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there is, uh, that's a very accurate portrayal of the amount of reserves we have. And uh, in Alaska, there's another at least 35 trillion cubic feet of gas, um, but no way to get it to the lower 48 except through some limited LNG facilities. Um, uh, currently, we have a, a deliverability problem, however. Uh, when prices collapsed a couple of years ago, um, a lot of people left the, the uh, oil and gas production business. A lot of wells were shut in um, and uh, production declined. It was a response to a variety of things that you can trace back to the collapse of the Asian economy. But um, uh, uh, what that's meant is that uh, uh, we have been using up that supply of cheap gas and, uh, and have had very little to replace it. Now, with gas prices escalating above $3, uh, as the Secretary mentioned, uh, there has been a, a, a dramatic increase in, uh, in exploration development. Uh, but there's a lag time of about 12 to 18 months. I don't think that most uh, uh, interstate natural gas transmission systems are, are full now, unless, unless it means uh, in the wintertime when they're taking a lot of supplies out of storage. Um, I think the situation is going to normalize itself, but, I, but uh, what we're, what the situation we're in today is the direct result of the price collapse a couple of years ago, and it's taking the gas industry some time to recover. Mr. McHugh. Mr. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Shays. Thank you. I uh, welcome all of you. I. Um, you get somewhat reluctant getting into this issue because if we're honest with each other, it's Republicans and Democrats who are in this together and both share blame. The administration shares blame and Congress obviously has things they can do. But as we do our specific issues, I'm just interested to know the Energy Department, which doesn't have other distractions, I'm just interested why it wasn't giving the clarion call that we were going to be having this problem. Why, as you admit, Mr. Richardson, why, why were why was the administration caught flat-footed on this? Well, I, first of all, I never admitted that. And secondly, we are not flat-footed. We have been uh, pushing, uh, in, in your region, the domestic heating oil crisis is the biggest problem. But and we have been saying that we needed a northeast oil reserve. We have been saying that stocks are low. Yes. We've been working with the home heating oil people on transportation. Uh, we've asked for authority for the Congress to let me just deal with this reserve, which is in your state. 
let me, let and, me just, and we uh, need it passed. Let me just remind you, though, you did have a meeting with New England members. Mr. Sanders was leading the charge, uh, and he was asking both that we uh, utilize the Strategic uh, Petroleum Reserve, and he put forward the Home Heating Reserve Bill in which we signed on. It wasn't an initiative of the administration. It was an initiative of Mr. Sanders in which we all readily agreed. And it was surprising to me that it kind of came out from a rank-and-file member and not from the administration. But let me ask you this. Why are you blaming Congress, and specifically the Republicans, uh, for the fact that um, the Energy Policy Conservation Act hasn't moved forward when it's Mrs. Boxer that's holding the bill up? Last time I checked, she was a Democrat. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I didn't blame any Republican. I said the Congress has not passed this. And there have been a number of holes. Uh, you mentioned a Democratic member. I was not aware of that. The other holes have not been by Democratic members, but I'm not, I don't think we need to dwell on that. We need this legislation passed. I need full authority for the trigger on the Northeast Home Heating Oil Reserve, for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, we need to pass it. I, I don't care what is holding it up. We just need to get it done. This is for the national interest. I'm not trying to point fingers. I'm just stating a fact. It's not authorized. Mr. Chase, would you yield for a... No, if I could just continue my questions, please. Yesterday we heard testimony um, about changes in the domestic oil marketplace since the 1980s, resulting in a far less vertically integrated supply and distribution system. In your views, just who or what is, quote unquote, big oil, and what is their role in today's domestic energy market? The FTC uh, conducted an investigation about why the price differentials were so high in some parts of the country. Uh, I think what the FTC in their preliminary investigation concluded, and, and that is not a complete report because they still are working on it, is that environmental factors, uh, the, the reformulated gasoline three to six cents, were not the cause for this increase for the spike, that the causes were uh, several, transportation problems, pipeline problems, market problems. Uh, I think that was perhaps what your question refers to. I, Mr. Shays, I'm not here to blame any industry or any members or any causes. I, I just think that we need to work together to have a, a, a comprehensive policy that deals with supply and that deals with demand. Uh, we have three weeks to go in the Congress, and there are a number of necessary steps that need to take place, too. In the same vein, the executive branch also has authority to take several steps, some of which the President is considering, uh, that deal with the present crisis. So the, the, the President, though, and the Vice President, which you refer to as the Clinton-Gore administration, has been making strong attacks against big oil. I just want to know what big oil is, and then, then we go from there. <laughs> Mr. Shays, this is a, a, a political campaign. Uh, I am the Secretary of Energy for the Clinton-Gore administration. I'm not interested in blaming anybody. I want to fix the problem, and I want to fix it with you. Um, I think the, it's been referred that uh, large oil companies have been doing quite well lately. Uh, their profits are up. Uh, the American people, I think, rightfully so, had questions in the Midwest about why the price spikes uh, increased dramatically. Uh, the price of oil is $38 a barrel. Uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, but I, I don't want to... Is big oil responsible for the $35 plus a barrel? No, it's a variety of factors. It's the market. Uh, it's uh, many other reasons. Well, wouldn't OPEC be the number one? In no, I think that OPEC uh, has been working with us uh, quietly uh, in the last three instances. They have raised production levels. Not enough. Uh, we operate on the free market. OPEC is a cartel. We opposed uh, their production cuts in the past. But the fact is that uh, we have a demand problem. Did, uh, was, isn't it true, though, that the administration earlier on was concerned with $10 a barrel and was encouraging OPEC to, 
to uh, limit supply to get that price up a bit? No, that's flatly wrong. And you, you weren't con concerned about domestic production that started to go down because we couldn't produce at $10? Well, yeah, of course. And I warned this, and I am publicly on record as saying that $10 a barrel per oil is not good. That's not good for the market. It's volatility. It hurts a lot of states in our country that produce uh, domestic oil and gas. The stable price that I think is ideal is between 20 and 25 dollars, but we think that the market should dictate those forces. Okay. Two, two last questions. The Strategic uh, Petroleum Reserve, which admittedly many members of Congress encourage you to release, so I'm not suggesting that I wasn't part of that, and also a part of the Home Heating Reserve. There are others who respond to our effort to do that uh, with some concern to distortion in the marketplace, as, as you just made reference to, but a concern that, for instance, with the Home Heating Reserve, that uh, people aren't, uh, the suppliers aren't going to build up a reserve uh, and w an inventory it if they're concerned that all of a sudden the administration, whichever administration, uh, decides to uh, release it and s uh, significantly reduce price. So there's a sense that maybe we're actually going to have less supply rather than more because of this reserve. The home heating oil reserve is just two million barrels. That we don't anticipate would affect the market. It's only there as many of you constructively suggested, for a supply emergency. And the, the language, uh, the trigger authorizing me to use it, uh, Mr. Shays, is based on, on, not on the price, but on the supply emergency. I welcome that. I, I don't want to base it on price. Uh, I think it should be on supply emergency. Uh, what the home heating oil operators lack as an incentive, as you said, the stock product reserve. We have to give them incentives to do that. We've been working with them, uh, transportation, uh, a number of other measures, uh, their interruptible contracts, and, and we have a good dialogue with them. Some have su suggested, and, and I'd welcome your thoughts, a tax credit for them uh, to store home heating oil, a uh, small tax credit to give them an incentive to store, because as you said, they are not storing right now because prices are so high. Thank you. And, and what would be the trigger uh, for releasing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? What, what should be the trigger? So we know it's not a political decision. Well, th th that's already in statute. Um, the trigger is a, a national supply emergency. The, you're talking about st yeah, Strategic Petroleum because we have the Northeast Reserve. Right. There, uh, the language is supply interruption. Okay, so it's, it's a little neb nebulous, though. I mean, in other words, the president can do it and say there's an emergency. Yes. Yeah. Let me just a a a end with this question. In a recent appearance before the House Committee on International Relations, you were asked if government, Governor Bush was responsible for today's high oil prices. Your answer, and I quote, was no. Is that still your position? Yeah. Governor Bush? Yes. Yeah. No, it's not his fault. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. McHugh? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to kind of fill out the record, what Mr. Shays and the uh, Secretary, you were talking about on RFG, I'm not familiar with the uh, Federal Trade Commission study, but I am familiar with a study done by the Congressional Research Service that found that 25 percent of that Secretary Brown is shaking her head, but I can read the English language. Yeah, we'd be happy to supply for the record. I actually have it with to, me, the I'd FTC I'd be delighted findings. to have you. Uh, Good. have you supply all that information, and that, but still the Congressional Research Service found that 25 percent of that increase, which is not even a majority of the increase, but a substantial part was due to that. And the Energy Information Agency, part of Secretary Richardson's own Department of Energy, found, if I can read the English language correctly, quote, the new product required a substantial change in the blend recipe and the characteristics of some of the components to make the new product. It went on to talk about uh, the significant difficulties of that reformulation uh, uh, on the price. You may want to forward that information to Secretary Richardson as well, because apparently his DIA isn't aware of it either. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I agree. We have to work together. Uh, I go home and uh, to a part of uh, the United States that encompasses the Adirondack Mountains, hundreds of miles of Canadian border where it will be snowing very soon. And uh, I don't think my people are concerned who's right and who's wrong, and I sure am not going to check their voter registration card. 
uh, before I see if we should help them or not. not. I know you well enough to believe very strongly you share that sentiment as well. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit less about the longer term approaches, not that they're unimportant, but rather what we can do now uh, to avert or at least to ameliorate what will be a crisis of life and death proportions in areas uh, that are served uh, by people such as Congressman Sanders, myself, and many others. I made the comment yesterday that it's hard to think about politics when it's snowing in your district seven months out of the year. It's hard to rationalize the current price of a gallon of oil uh, based on statistics that uh, average it out over two decades when your main industry, as is true in both Bernie Sanders and my district, is the dairy industry and you're receiving the same price for your product today that you were 20 years ago. And I would suggest that a 100% increase in the cost of home heating fuel, 100% approximately cost increase in the, in the price of diesel fuel that, that runs your tractors, uh, that uh, allows you to make a living as meager as it is, is truly uh, an emergency. OPEC has talked about uh, a target of $28 a barrel for oil. Uh, where, where do we stand, and by we I mean this country, uh, on that target? Is that a reasonable cost? We've heard a lot yesterday from people in the oil industry who said that the great anomaly was the $10 a barrel of oil. Fine. Let's accept that. Is 28 reasonable or is that a... Uh, an objective that we should accept now, or, or how do we react to $28 a barrel? Congressman, what, what we have said is that 10 is too low, 30, now 30 plus is much too high. What we have said ideally is between 20 and $25. Uh, naturally, 28 is better than what exists today. Um, nonetheless, uh, OPEC has established what is called a price ban. Anytime there's between 22, uh, if there's, it exceeds $28, and you mentioned that 28, they would automatically uh, increase production if it's, I think, 20 days by 500,000 barrels. That has not always happened. Our, our view is that the market should dictate these forces, but we are, we think that for producer and consumer countries, 20 and 25 is good for economic growth, uh, to quell recessions, and, and to deal with the basic supply and demand laws. What has happened, Congressman, is a dramatic increase in demand throughout the world. It's not just our country. It's uh, in Europe I, yeah. and Asia. Right. But I, and I share your concerns very much about your region. This is why we, we think the Northeast Home Heating Oil Reserve is important. The President, uh, there's a real acute home heating oil shortage in the Northeast. We're, we're very worried about it. And, that, and that's why I, I wish to explore further. And I was an early uh, supporter of Congressman Sanders' bill, a co-sponsor, original co-sponsor, and I was proud to do so. And I commend the President for creating it by executive order. I think it'll help. I hope it'll help, but I'm not sure it's going to be enough. Uh, you talk about market forces. Uh, I'm a Republican and generally a market-oriented kind of guy. Uh, but the market's not working uh, sufficiently right now. And, and, and uh, it seems to me when OPEC increases, as they did about two weeks ago, their pledge on uh, an additional $500,000 a barrel and your North crude oil goes up to over $33 a barrel uh, within hours, uh, we've got to do something more. I I'm very concerned that the President, uh, the administration, has not uh, taken in the steps or seen fit to release the strategic petroleum oil reserve uh, supplies. If we don't do that, thinking only in the short term, what can we do to ensure that this winter won't be a catastrophe for many people in the colder climes of this country? What other remedies are there short of hoping that OPEC will, will sufficiently increase production? Congressman, we will continue to urge uh, OPEC to consider increasing production because it is obvious that the world needs more oil. Secondly, on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, uh, 
whether it's a sale or a swap or other proposals, uh, the President is actively considering that right now. Uh, at this very moment, a decision uh, is, is imminent. He may decide not to tap it. We've been very reluctant to tap it in the past because of uh, the language in the legislation that it should be uh, a national supply emergency. We used it during the Gulf. We've used it very sparingly. What else can we do, Congressman? I think we can work together on additional uh, low-income energy assistance funds. I know in your district you have a lot of moderate income and poor people that, uh, that, that could use this. We're also, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the North Eating Oil Reserve, we need to get that passed, even with executive order, the trigger for its use is important. We also uh, believe uh, that uh, heating oil deliveries uh, are very important that we, that they take place without any transportation or pipeline problems. We work with the Coast Guard to ensure their ready access into the harbors that reach you. Uh, we have had a number of emergency uh, efforts uh, in the event of a home heating oil shortage, exercises with regions and states to deal with the problem, including, I believe, your state. Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, the shortages are one thing. Fuel disruption is another. Affordability is, is the most important, and that's, that's what disturbs me, and I think that that's the, the key question here that's being avoided. In fact, as one of the strongest supporters of LIHEAP, there's an economic reality that the more you take out of the market through LIHEAP, the higher price pressures you place on people who are at the lower income levels who, who don't qualify, many of whom live in my district. So that's, that's not the answer either. The final, the final comment on this is that there has to be a release of sport. There's no other way that I see, and it's not that I'm unwilling to entertain it for any reason, political or otherwise, but the only way a crisis of price is going to be avoided, not supply interruptions, but affordability, is through SPORE. So I hope you'll continue to press that with the President, because that's, that's, it seems to me, the sole relief. Uh, Secretary Browner, in your comments, you, you spoke about uh, your pending uh, regulations to reduce the uh, sulfur level of on-road diesel. Uh, yes, in my written testimony I did speak about the diesel. I'd be happy to speak about it now. Uh, you did not in your spoke in your uh, in No, your I was oral? talking about um, last year's um, uh, uh, rule uh, to remove sulfur from conventional gasoline, I not from diesel. I misunderstood. I was yeah. reading while you were speaking and I didn't bring the proper nexus. I apologize. Well, let's talk about the, the proposed uh, reduction. That's a 98 percent reduction uh, in the uh, sulfur level of on-road diesel. Uh, I know I heard you spoke, uh, speak about the flexibilities and the opportunities that you're trying to access and working with industry and such. Uh, it can come as no secret to you uh, that the industry is very concerned, uh, not just the, uh, the uh, diesel producing industry, but the manufacturing industry that will uh, use these uh, diesel supplies to, to power their, their machinery are concerned that, number one, the technology today simply does not exist to accommodate uh, this kind of reduction. Uh, in my chairman's home state of Indiana, Cummins Manufacturing uh, has stated, and I quote, Cummins has been in this business for 80 years and we don't know if these standards can be met and what the total cost is, how possibly can EPA with no explanation or justification, EPA has chosen to propose a regulatory scheme without the meaningful exchange of technical information and ideas that preceded prior proposals. For such far-reaching standards, extraordinary and as yet undeveloped technology will be needed and huge investments in time and resources will be committed. They go on uh, to say this is uh, what they feel is an unachievable and an unworkable approach. The other thing that troubles me is that the Department of Agriculture well the Department of uh, I thank you madam chair and I'll try to be brief the Department of Agriculture asked uh, that EPA should provide more information to demonstrate the fuel supplies to farmers in rural areas will not be uh, interrupted as the industry converts to the ultra sulfur diesel fuel the industry offered 90 percent apparently uh, the EPA is consistent on 98 percent, has refused to extend the public comment period, even when 
the administration's own Department of Agriculture says this is ill-considered. Uh, I'm curious how you'd respond to those kinds of objections. Um, first of all, uh, this effort to reduce uh, pollution from on-road vehicles, cars, SUVs, diesel, trucks and buses has been uh, the work of the EPA and the administration for seven to eight years now. This is not uh, a new idea. This is not something we have come to lately. Uh, specifically with respect to diesel, uh, diesel fuel today has approximately uh, 500 parts per million uh, sulfur. It is a very, very high sulfur content. With that high sulfur content, content comes a whole host of public health, uh, particularly respiratory uh, issues. Uh, we have uh, made a proposal uh, to reduce the pollution that comes out of the tailpipes of large trucks and buses. The way you change the pollution out of the tailpipe is you make adjustments in the fuel, you make adjustments in the engine, uh, you add things like catalytic converters. Uh, you note that there are companies who have raised questions, and we are in dialogue with those companies as we did when we set the car and SUV standards last year. I would also like to note for the record there are companies that are supporting our proposal. For example, BP Amico has written in support of the 15 parts per million diesel fuel standard that we have proposed. Uh, there are manufacturers, uh, the companies that will make the catalytic converters, the companies that will make the technologies to meet the tailpipe standards. Uh, they are supporting our proposals. There are even engine manufacturers that are supporting our proposals. Having said all of that, this is a complicated undertaking. We have been at it for many years. We are listening to all of the parties concerned. We are trying to honor uh, requests from many, many governors. I don't think we've heard from a single governor who is opposing uh, these proposals to help them clean up the air their people breathe. One of the most important things we can do at the national level is to look at the on-road diesel fuel. And, and this is important because you're going to hear people talk about all diesel fuel. We are talking right now about the diesel fuel that it's used on the road, not off the road, not in farming equipment, but in the 18-wheelers in um, the buses. So uh, we, our, we go back to the division of, of fuel that the chairman pointed out uh, even further in his comments, and apparently 90 percent reduction voluntarily has been rejected, and you refuse to extend the comment period. How can you talk about I will, about again, um, and let me note that that is some companies' position. It is not all company positions. When you look at what comes out of the tailpipe, if you want to clean up that, that, that goop, that, that, that stuff that we all hate sitting behind, that, that fog, if you will, that comes out of uh, the large trucks, the diesel buses, you have to do two things. You have to clean up the fuels. When you clean up the fuels, that allows you to put on the first ever catalytic converters. How many of you knew that? Catalytic converters do not exist on the large diesel trucks and buses. The clean fuel is necessary. I might just point out, uh, while BP Amico says 15 is fine, others in the industry have said something higher, you should know where Detroit is. You should know where the engine manufacturers, they want five ppm of uh, sulfur content, not the 15 which we have proposed. So by way of saying this is a complicated issue, we are engaged in a thoughtful process. We are uh, committed to finishing this because, and I think this is important, if there is one thing I have heard over the last seven and a half years from CEOs in this company, it is give them as much time as possible to meet environmental standards. Uh, the sooner we finish, the sooner they know, the sooner they can start looking at how to most cost effectively meet these standards. Secondly, we are working, for example, I had a lengthy meeting with the CEO of Cummins yesterday. Uh, they have their position, but we did take the time, despite their position of opposition, to hear what they had to say about how we might be able to structure the flexibilities. Uh, they may ultimately never agree with us, but we are open to anyone who wants to so, bring us a proposal so assume, on flexibility. Time, I assume actually, that's a no, you won't extend the, the comment period. That was my we question. We have not made any final decisions. We are reviewing everything that we have received. We are committed to getting the public health benefits that will come from cleaner diesel engines and fuels. So you may extend Madam the Chairman, the gentleman's uh, time yes has no. expired. Thank you.
at, and uh, in deference to the fact that we did give more time to this side, we will extend to the minority side an extra five minutes. So I'll recognize Mr. Waxman for uh, 35 minutes and maybe uh, another answer, yes or no, could be part of a response <laughs> to Mr. Waxman. Thank question. you very much for giving us the extra time and uh, we appreciate the witnesses being here and I appreciate the tone but, and, under which Mr. McHugh addressed this issue because what he pointed out in his uh, time was that we've got a problem in this country and we need to work together on this problem. It's not a Democratic or Republican problem. We are facing an energy crisis in some of our parts of our country and with the heating oil prices uh, and maybe even availability uh, being very, very high. And uh, we see electricity rates in California, maybe other places are soaring. The gas prices are rising. So we need to address these problems. It's our responsibility, both the Congress and the administration. Uh, we're seeing that uh, we're greatly dependent on foreign oil and we're able to be manipulated by OPEC. Uh, the way that government works is the president, and all of you represent the president in his administration, proposes ideas, but then the Congress is supposed to dispose of these ideas. And the administration has proposed a number of initiatives that would help resolve our country's short and long-term energy needs. Secretary Richardson, I'd like to begin by asking you about some of these administration proposals. One of our basic safeguards against oil price manipulation by OPEC is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. My understanding is that the President has urged Congress to reauthorize the presidential authority to utilize the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in times of energy crisis, but Congress hasn't done so. Could you describe why the administration believes reauthorization of SPRO is important? Mr. Chairman, uh, the reauthorization of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, the, is essential because uh, the ability for the Secretary of Energy to advise the, the President when it's uh, a case of national emergency shortages, uh, when you also have to manage the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We've got 570 plus million barrels that uh, has been a very wise investment. You have to manage it, you have to replenish it, you have to maintain it. Uh, so that full authority to use it, uh, the authority for the trigger in a national supply emergency is needed. Plus there have been a number of, I think, add-ons relating to the authorities, uh, relating to some energy initiatives here that are part of that bill. And, and, and we need it passed. It's not passed. What are the consequences if Congress continues to block this reauthorization of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? I think uh, a questioning of, of the executive branches is my authority to use uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in time of emergency. And, and we think that it uh, is needed uh, as a very urgent priority, along with the Northeast Home Heating Oil Reserve, the trigger to use in case of an emergency. Let's say sometime this winter in New England, there's a home heating oil crisis and, and we haven't resolved it and I, have, I don't have the authority to use it. One of the uh, other areas we can deal with is energy crisis is to reduce uh, uh, reduce our dependence on foreign oil by increasing energy efficiency. If we used our energy resources more efficiently and effectively. Uh, over the past several years, the administration has proposed tax breaks to encourage Americans to purchase energy efficient cars as well as homes. What's happened to these initiatives, uh, Secretary Rich? They've They've languished $4 billion worth of uh, tax credits on energy efficiency for homes, for fuel efficient vehicles, for buildings. Um, Chairman Waxman, we, we, we think that we can dramatically improve uh, our energy resources in this country by having increased energy efficiency, but you have to have incentives for that to happen, a partnership for a new generation of vehicles with the oil, with the auto companies to have more efficient engines, to have SUVs that uh, are 40 miles per gallon. A lot of the issues that uh, Administrator Browner has championed in fuel efficiency, they're, they're lagging and we need that to pass to have a, an energy policy that is based on uh, that deals with the supply needs of the country but also with demand. So the administration proposed these ideas of, of some tax 
incentives to become more efficient, the Congress hasn't acted on them. And uh, it seems to me that what we see is uh, we're not making the progress towards energy independence that we could if Congress would act to work with the administration to pass this legislation. And you made an excellent point about renewable energy. Uh, we have to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. It's uh, 57, 58 percent now. Um, if we invest in new technologies, as you said, and we invest in wind and solar and biomass, in uh, bioenergy and uh, fuel cells, uh, these are worthy investments. And only 7 percent of the administration's budget in that area in the past seven years has been funded, seven. Let me draw your attention to the question of electricity restructuring, because uh, yesterday's hearing we heard from witnesses who had recently experienced sharp rises in electricity rates and brownouts. Two years ago, the administration proposed legislation that would have provided for restructuring of our nation's electric uh, utilities. Could you describe the key provisions of this proposal and how this proposal could help address some of the problems we currently face with our electricity system? And tell us, has Congress acted on the administration's proposal to modernize our electric utilities? Well, regrettably, one of the House chairmen dealing with this issue said the electricity restructuring bill was dead in the Commerce Committee, which is the main vehicle for passage. We regret that. What our bill does, Chairman Waxman, it is increase competition. Uh, it will s improve the environment. It will save the customer money. What we want to do is several things. One, uh, deal with the fundamental problems that exist of uh, inadequate transmission, uh, generation facilities, improve energy efficiency efforts in our electricity grid, uh, push for uh, independent uh, power operators so that utilities and other power sources can invest in our electricity grid that is uh, badly in shape, that needs modernizing. Uh, what you have is a dramatic increase in demand and uh, an electricity grid that has not uh, had strong authority and strong uh, investments to keep it refurbished. The bill gives Chairman Hecker and FERC the authority to take several steps to make our grid more reliable and efficient. Uh, that's language, too, and after the brownouts and blackouts around the country, after the fact that over 26 states have already had restructuring legislation in their state legislatures, including California, uh, the federal bill would have impede would, would have had rules of the road that enabled a lot of federal statutes that are harmful to be uh, removed, and, and regrettably, this bill is not moving. Well, what we've had is administration proposals to uh, reauthorize the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, to give tax breaks for energy efficiencies, to have a partnership with the automobile industry to produce cleaner and more efficient automobiles. We've had proposals for electricity restructuring. We've had ideas from the administration, specific ideas and proposals for funding for conservation and renewable energy. And none of that has been moved in the Congress of the United States. Now, let's look at what some of the things are that we've seen in the Congress, initiatives here. Uh, Congress hasn't been receptive to your energy proposals, and I suppose it's because the leadership in the Congress thinks it has some better ideas. Uh, I'd like to get your comments about some of these other ideas that they have. Every year since 1995, the Republican leadership has introduced a measure known as Department of Energy Abolishment Act, which would have abolished the Department of Energy. What's your view on, on whether this proposal will help advance uh, energy policy? I know it'll cost you your job, but uh, <laughs> w is this a constructive way for us to deal with our energy policy, just abolish the Department of Energy? Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to be humorous. Sometimes I wondered whether that did make sense in light of my recent. But no, I, let me just say that. <laughs> Of course not. The Department of Energy has very valuable functions. It deals with our nuclear weapons, uh, electricity, renewable energy. It deals with a lot of very important national security programs with Russia and nonproliferation programs. It's the ultimate science agency in the government. 
It's a very important department. That's not the way to deal with the problem. Absolutely not. And we can laugh about it because it really is a laughable idea that a response with the leadership of the Congress of the United States and sponsored by many members of this committee, including one member who said, well, the administration's failed. But their answer was to abolish the Department of Energy. And then another answer they've had is, let's allow drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. What, what, does that make sense? Well, we're opposed to that, uh, Congressman Waxman, because we think that it's a very ecologically sensitive area. Uh, the caribou and other wildlife, we believe, would be harmed. We think there's sufficient other area in Alaska that could be drilled that is already available that can uh, properly deal with our energy needs. We think that there's some very, very sensitive parts in the country. And by the way, the, the offshore uh, drilling in California and Florida uh, was congressionally mandated. So it's not something that uh, that came out just from one branch of the government. It came not from not only was it congressionally us. mandated, but it was congressionally mandated on a very strong bipartisan yes. vote. Most members of Congress, whether Democrat or Republican, don't want to go out and have oil rigs off our coast. We don't want it in California. I don't think people on the East Coast want it, and their representatives all across the country said no to that idea. Now, another way we can deal with this energy problem is to set up standards for automobiles that uh, uh, they're known as CAFE standards, the Corporate Average Fuel Economy. That's to make sure that the, the, the average fuel efficiency standards that we require for cars are going to uh, may, mean that we have less reliance on, on, um, on, on fuel. Uh, in fact, Honda has brought a car to the market using a hybrid electric technology that gets 70 miles to the gallon. Toyota will soon be selling a four-passenger car that achieves over 60 miles to the gallon. And Congress has blocked the Department of Transportation for the last five years from even studying where the greater fuel efficiency is feasible. As a result, fuel economy levels have stagnated. And since the 1980s, CAFE standards have only required that new cars average 27.5. Honda's getting 70. Congress has said that we all, we're, all we, we're going to allow 27.5 miles per gallon, and light trucks average 20.6 miles. Uh, per gallon. Uh, it, it, it just seems to me we need to be addressing our fundamental energy problems. We need to address our dependence on imported oil and our reliance on antiquated electric uh, system. But can't, Congress hasn't acted on these issues. Instead, we do nothing, and when something inevitably goes wrong, and we're now seeing it, our system going wrong, we search frantically for someone else to blame. And this is the political season. So what we have are hearings where one of the members asked the first question, how, why has the administration failed to deal with the energy crisis? Well, that, that's not taking responsibility that we all have. You have and we have in the Congress of the United States. Administrator Browner, I want to ask you some questions because yesterday we heard a number of different claims from majority members that suggested environmental regulations in general and the Clean Air Act in particular are causing our energy problems. And I want to talk about some of these issues. Uh, we heard there's simply too much red tape and environmental regulation. We had a lot of colorful analogies. For example, the National Petrochemical and Refiners Association testified that EPA has created a regulatory blizzard for the nation's refiners. Now, you addressed this issue earlier about this claim that we're not, you're not allowing permits for new refiner, uh, refinery construction. Uh, Chairman Burton made a big point of stating that no new refineries have been built since the early 1980s, and he alleged it was due to permit requirements under the Clean Air Act, and he went on to blame the failure of EPA to approve new refineries as one of the major causes of today's high gasoline prices. Ms. Brown, do you know how many applications EPA has received since the early 1980s to build new refineries? For brand new ground up? Brand new refineries. Uh, we may have gotten one in 25 years. One. Well, is it possible for EPA to issue a permit for new oil refineries if no one's applied for it? No. It requires a company to come forward and make an application. Many come forward to expand their existing facilities and those get granted. But a new one would require a company to come forward and make the application. Now, I, I, I say, I raise this question, because I think it's highly misleading to say that you're not giving permits for new refineries. That's the reason for the problem. 
Uh, it's completely misleading. They're not coming to us. And I spend a lot of time with the petroleum refiners of this country. We work closely with them on a lot of fuel issues. They don't come in and meet with us on building new refineries. We're, we're there. We're available if that's what they want to talk about. But what they are talking to you about is, uh, uh, and they're getting permits from you, is to uh, build not new refineries, but to consolidate and expand their yes. existing refineries. And that's the trend that I understand that's is right. continuing. Oil companies are not asking to build new facilities. They want to modify and expand the existing ones. Can you tell us w whether that's happening and whether you're giving out permits or uh, what's happening with their efforts to uh, expand and modify their facilities? Um, absolutely. Um, they are expanding their facilities, and we and the states uh, do grant these permits. I, I think I mentioned earlier uh, that in the last two years, we've had 12, 12 applications uh, for expansion of existing facilities. Uh, five, uh, seven of those have already been issued. Five are currently pending, and we presume will be wrapped up in a timely manner. I mean, what's happening is you can't just look at, is it 200 facilities and then, you know, 155. Uh oh! You have to look at what are the 155 capable of doing, and that's what that chart shows. Their capacity is actually going up, and we are granting the permits to allow that to happen. We would welcome a permit for a new refinery if someone wants to bring it. We'll give it the full review. And how long does it take? Uh, for the um, expansions, uh, most of them are managed within uh, 12 months. Um, about half of them are managed within five months. I just want to cite for the record, Citgo applied in March and is expected to be approved within two to six weeks. Valero applied in July and is expected to be approved by the end of the year. Correct. Exxon Mobil applied in June and is expected to be approved by the end of this year. And as I understand, there have also been two applications in Minnesota. One has been approved and one is pending. Correct. Now let's turn to the issue of electricity generation. At yesterday's hearing, we spent considerable time discussing California's energy situation and new power plants that are currently expected to come online. In that discussion, the Clean Air Act was repeatedly blamed for the length of time it takes to cite uh, energy projects. For instance, allegations were made that imply that it takes six to seven years to get a permit under the Clean Air Act to cite high voltage transmission line. Another witness mentioned an anecdote of 15 years we being required to cite a high voltage transmission line. Ms. Brown, we've, we've Ms. Browner, we've investigated these allegations. They don't appear to have any basis in fact. My understanding is that the Clean Air Act permits are not required for citing a transmission lines. Could you clarify the committee whether there are any requirements for transmission lines to be permitted under the Clean Air Act? Uh, there are no Clean Air Act requirements. There are no Clean Air Act permits required to cite a transmission line. Uh, those decisions are made by states under any number of laws uh, that they're responsible for, but we do not engage in the citing of transmission lines. In the case of power plants, as distinguished from transmission lines, there are Clean Air requirements. Yes. Uh, and the Clean Air Act does require that new power plants be permitted, un uh -huh. permitted under the Clean Air Act. Wh why is that the case? Um, the Clean Air Act uh, looks at the emissions from uh, power plants, and based on those emissions, Congress uh, required us to set up a permitting uh, program. But, but there, too, uh, Mr. Waxman, it's important to understand what the real facts are. Uh, we have, and the states have received in the last two years, including some very, very recently, 300 applications for electric turbines. Um, over 60 percent of those have already been issued. They move through the process very rapidly, again, uh, on the order of approximately 12 months on average. Uh, the states take the uh, first step in this. We frequently do not become involved except to concur in what the state uh, is requiring in terms of pollution uh, reductions, and we all work together and it moves very quickly. My understanding is that the Commission's process rarely takes longer than 18 months, you say, an Correct. average of uh, 12 months. Now, I also understand that over the last few years, hundreds of applications under the Clean Air Act have been filed for new gas turbine electric mm -hmm. generation. And these applications have been filed under the Prevention of Significant yes. Deterioration part of the Clean Air Act. How long does it typically take uh, for a PSD permit to be approved? Again, those are moving on an average of 12 to 18 months. So what you're saying, in essence, is that once again, the facts just don't support the rhetoric that we've been hearing. Uh, if there is a seven-year permitting process, we are happy to look at it. Our numbers do not show that. I do want to remind all of the committee members that because of the Clean Air Act, 
you all made the decision that the states would have the first bite at the apple. We see it only after they have come through an initial process. We generally concur in what the states are doing. Uh, Ms. Browner, we've gone through some of the allegations with you right here on the record about the cost of the Clean Air Act. What your answers indicate is that the allegations of delays and high costs don't have much basis in fact. My experience is that this frequently happens when industry complaints are closely scrutinized. And I've been in the Congress for 25 years. I sat on the committee that dealt with the, the energy policies and the Clean Air Act. It's not this committee, it's the Commerce Committee. And the fact is, industry regularly overstated the cost of complying with environmental regulations. When we were considering the Clean Air Act of 1990, which passed almost unanimously, signed by President Bush, we, we had industries come in and tell us that the costs to comply with that law were virtually going to bankrupt the economy. And of course, nothing like that has happened. And I want to give examples, because the record, people forget what the record is. Every time we have a hearing, somebody comes and makes these wild charges. Yesterday we heard, yesterday at this hearing, we heard from Stephen Simon, a senior executive at ExxonMobil, who raised concerns about the cost of EPA fuel regulations. But his company has an, a history of exaggerating compliance costs. When we were considering the reformulated gasoline provisions of the Clean Air Act, Mobil wrote to members of Congress that the requirements should not be adopted because, and I want to quote, they wrote to us, the technology to meet these standards simply does not exist today. And then it turned out to be completely wrong, untrue. The reformulated gasoline provisions went into effect in 1995 and have brought about tremendous clean air benefits, just so people understand that. In addition to trying to make new cars cleaner by, re by emitting fewer pollutants, we try to make the gasoline burn in a cleaner fashion as well. That's the reformulated gasoline mm -hmm. issue. Has that been a success, and have the uh, petroleum companies been able to comply? It's been, it's been a tremendous um, success and in terms of cleaning the air and, and in a very cost-effective uh, manner. And, and, and similar, we believe, and we have every reason to believe, that the low sulfur gasoline requirements, which are now in place and will start to take effect in 2004, uh, will similarly be very cost effective. And just as an example, let me point again to the fact BP Amico is already selling the low sulfur gasoline and not with a price def differential. They are already selling what we are going to require all companies to sell in uh, beginning in 2004 today in a number of cities, and they will be adding more cities to that list in the coming uh, weeks and months. I mean, that is a real, I think, testament to the fact that when we set these standards, not only do we achieve a level of public health and environmental protections, but we're doing it in a sensible way that works for the businesses of, these con of our country. I just want to give another example of the kind of statements we hear at hearings that turn out to be absolutely wrong. The utility industry, when we are looking at trying to adopt legislation to stop acid rain, they exaggerated the costs. The chemical industry said that if we phased out uh, chlorofluorocarbons, it would cause massive disruptions. The auto, in auto industry said they couldn't meet new tailpipe standards. Yet each one of these statements turned out to be wrong. Once we adopted the law, President Bush signed that law, and all these industry groups uh, went ahead and not only complied, but even did better than the law required under many circumstances. And so I, I, I think it's important when we hear these exaggerations by industry groups uh, uh, to keep that in mind, especially when their answer is to drill on our coastlines and go up and drill in Alaska. And, uh, and, and that's their answer. That's their answer to the energy crisis. Now, Secretary Richardson, I, I, I'm going to yield my time to some other members, but you made a statement I just want to ask you about because I just... And I know you don't want to blame anybody. You want to be a statesman. You've been at the UN, so you know what being a statesman is all about. But I, I was sort of taken aback when you said you, you don't think a OPEC should be held responsible for the crisis that's happening in this country. And I know we're, we're to blame ourselves when Congress doesn't act. The you know, we don't do anything to reduce our, our reliance on fuels. But OPEC's a cartel. they got a monopoly. They can turn off and on the spigot. They know that we're dependent on on their oil. Why, why don't we just admit that they're playing games with us? Uh, Chairman. Mr. Waxman, let me be very 
careful because I have to deal with these energy ministers all the time. And I, I do want to be clear. I believe that OPEC, the last three meetings they had in which uh, they were considering increasing production, uh, they did so. A lot of it was uh, their own reasons, but uh, our quiet diplomacy, I believe, worked. I think that they have acted responsibly in terms of the increases, 3.5 million barrels more than existed at the time. Uh, obviously, the markets have not responded. Uh, the world needs more oil. So I don't want to blame OPEC for the misfortunes of, of a world that uh, has dramatically increased demand and a number of uh, intersected uh, energy problems that we have. Uh, I believe our poli policy towards OPEC, which is one of uh, quiet diplomacy, constructive engagement with them, uh, pushing for increases in production, uh, 2.5 million in their March meeting, 700,000 in their meeting in uh, June, and 800,000 meeting at their last meeting, and possibly more soon, uh, has worked. I think Saudi Arabia has showed a dramatically positive leadership. Uh, well, so, Mr. Secretary, I understand what you're saying, but the answer to OPEC is for this country and the West to become less dependent on them. And I hope the high prices that they're forcing on us and the games they're playing will m be a, a, a signal to all of us that we've got to wake up and become more energy efficient and less dependent on foreign oil for our own economic well-being and our national security. I don't like the idea of OPEC having that much control. We saw what happened in the 70s, and we're seeing the exact same thing again. And the best way to stop this is for us to take the actions that we need to take. And the, I don't think there's no question that markets and not cartels should set prices. You're absolutely right. And that uh, we do need to dramatically reduce our reliance on imported oil. There's no question about that. Thank you. I want to yield to, to Mr. Cassini. Can I ask how much time there's remaining on this slide? We're going to yield in. Uh, but there's a limited amount of time. Yeah, but then we'll go on the five minute rule. Mr. Cassini, I'm yielding Mr. Cassini a few minutes, and then we'll see if we can get to you, Mr. Cassini. Okay. I understand there's about 12 minutes left, and you know I'm willing to go for three minutes. Uh, in some of the documents in preparation for this hearing, we were told that the um, – first of all, I want to say something here. I want to thank uh, Secretary Richardson and also Carol Browner, who I've had an opportunity to work with closely over the last few years, for your work for this country. You both did an outstanding, an outstanding job. And I really want to thank you for that. I haven't had a chance to, to work with uh, Mr. Hecker, so I want to direct my questions to you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. We, we are told that uh, uh, natural gas now sells at a record high of 5.22 uh, per, uh, uh, per million British thermal units, more than three times the uh, 1.60 futures price, price in March of 1999. Uh, back home in Cleveland, you know, this hearing gets kind of global at times. Back home in Cleveland, Ohio, people are experiencing sharp increases for the price, for the price of natural gas. And it's September. And we know, you know, we know the difference between September and January in Cleveland, trust me. Why? Why are we seeing such a steep rise in natural gas prices even before families are turning on the heat? Uh, well, I think the explanation was uh, the one I gave earlier, that we have a deliverability squeeze. There is, I think, plenty what is of... That? What is a deliverability squeeze? Well, what it means is that the, uh, the production uh, from uh, domestic wells has declined seriously as a result of a price collapse a couple of years ago, uh, that uh, the industry, the production area hasn't uh, recovered from that yet, and, uh, and that there will be a lag time till adequate supplies reach the market to drive the price uh, back down to, to more reasonable levels. You know, our, our time's limited here, so I, I, I'm, excuse me for, That's for interrupting, but I, I, I want to ask you this. Now, in the meeting you had yesterday in Ohio, the reporting that came out of that meeting that's cited in the Cleveland Plain Dealer here 
says that there's adequate supplies. So on one hand, we have some people in the natural gas industry saying, well, we don't have adequate supplies. Others are saying we do have adequate supplies, but we're seeing already anticipations of even higher prices. My question to you is, I heard your remarks, uh, how do you thwart market power? Are you ready to exert pressures on the market to keep the rates down? And are the rates subject to discipline by, by you? And if you're monitoring them, what do you intend to do for my constituents and for people in the Midwest who right now are, are faced with some horrible choices in their households when these uh, rates uh, start to go up? What is, what is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission going to do for the American people? Well, that's an excellent question. And uh, uh, our concerns uh, about um, about the uh, the uh, impact on retail customers is going to have to be addressed largely uh, at the retail regulatory level in the states. Uh, you will recall, Congressman, that uh, that Congress decontrolled uh, the price of natural gas uh, in the 1970s and 80s. It is an unregulated commodity, and we have a real market out there. And this market is reflecting. Uh, a supply demand imbalance right now. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the problem perhaps is somewhat definitional in the sense that I think everyone would agree that this country has adequate natural gas reserves, uh, enough for decades and decades. What we don't have is uh, ample gas in the pipeline, in storage, and the market is uh, uh, and a lot of natural gas now is traded in the forward markets and, and the NYMEX, uh, and the market is saying that its uh, value is greater in the interstate market. The, I, uh, we I, don't control that. Thank you. I, I know there are other members who have questions. I thank you. Uh, we have uh, practically running out of our time, but I'm going to yield to Mr. Uh, well, Mr. Sanders in seniority, so let me yield to him two and a half minutes if we could, and then we'll see if we can get more time for I, I apologize yeah. to my colleagues here, but thank you, Mr. Mr. Him. Uh, Two points. Um, I want to I want to thank you for all of the work that both of you have done in so many areas. But there is something that uh, I want to raise to you today. I'm going to read from a publication, uh, and this is what it says: uh, Venezuelan proposal detailed at Washington meeting. Uh, the U.S. September 20th rejected a proposal by Venezuela's PDVSA in which the state company would stock its crude storage terminal in the Bahamas with heating oil and sell the additional distillate directly to the United States government. Quote, we appreciate the offer of storage, but there is currently no need for storage of crude or product in the U.S., quote, a DOE spokeswoman told Platts. Platts is the publication. The spokeswoman said that while the U.S. welcomed PDVSA's offer to boost distillate production, the DOE urged Venezuela to put the additional product on the market, quote, as soon as possible, quote, end quote, rather than attempting to make a direct sale to the U.S. government. Quote, there is no need for U.S. government involvement in the purchase of this distillate, the spokeswoman said. Far as I know, we have a crisis in the Northeast regarding home heating oil. If Venezuela is prepared to sell us this product at a reasonable price, why don't we buy it? Congressman, we think they should put it on the market. Um, they've, uh, Venezuela has had proposals like this before. Um, what we like to see is distillate on the market. And Venezuela has been a constructive partner in a lot of these OPEC discussions. But it is our view that uh, while it's an interesting proposal, uh, it uh, would be better accomplished by them putting this distillate on the market. The second point I want to make, there will be a lot of reports that India, Saudi Arabia, other parts of the world have sufficient distillate that they want to sell us, that all we have to do is go out and get it. Those, those reports have, have not been confirmed. So uh, with this proposal that the Venezuelans, our friends, have been making, our view is this is great. You I'm, have the distillate. Put it out on the market. I'm not sure that I uh, agree. Let me raise uh, just two other brief questions. I have very little time. Uh, Mr. Waxman raised the question of OPEC being a cartel. Now, I am not a great fan of the WTO, but as I understand WTO rules, cartels are in violation of free trade. Now, I don't understand why the U.S. trade representatives running all over the world, we had an agreement with China the other day about free trade, 
Why doesn't somebody in the United States government says that this cartel is in violation of free trade agreements? Why don't we take them to the WTO? Are they in violation of free trade? I think the evidence is overwhelming they are. Anyone disagree with me? I don't see any. I'm listening. If they're in violation, we just passed the free trade agreement with China yesterday. I voted against it. Why aren't we standing up to these guys? I think that there's something, I pick up on what Mr. Waxman said before, there is something very, very strange about our relation for OPEC. And let me be honest about it. I voted against the war in 1991. But we lost, people shed blood there. We have thousands of people suffering from Gulf War illness today. And there's something, I think the Vermont Air National Guard is now over there protecting the airspace. And I think that being treated by our OPEC quote unquote allies, who we supply military equipment to, who we prop up, who are billionaire rulers, I don't know if they've allowed in Kuwait women to drive yet or something, if they're making progress in freedom in that respect. I think there's something funny going on and we're not hearing the whole truth about it. Let me just ask uh, Ms. Brown a question. I want to applaud you for stressing what I think is the $64 issue, and that is energy efficiency. Can you very briefly, in the very little time that I have left, just tell the American people what it would mean in terms of the saving of energy in this country if we move forward boldly in terms of energy efficiency? I think the best thing to do is look at our track record to date. Uh, for example, our green lights program is saving during peak reduction in 2,000, 6,100 milliwatts. Uh, when we look at programs from green lights to computers uh, to other types of equipment we use in our homes, we believe that energy efficiency could save the average American family on the order of $400 in annual electric home heating, et cetera. I mean, if we became much more energy efficient, isn't it clear that we could break our dependency on Mideast oil to a significant degree? Uh, we could certainly uh, reduce it to a significant degree. I mean, I, I think that the, you know, there's this sense out there that somehow or other we did this energy efficiency thing back in the 70s and we're done. The technology has advanced, the industry has advanced. There are a number of things we can do, and they are incredibly cost effective to do them, and yet we cannot get Congress, unfortunately, to support our funding requests so we can go out there and do it. Yeah. The gentleman, Thank gentleman's you. time has expired. Mr. Uh, who's next down there? Mr. Is O.C.? Mr. O.C.? Thank you, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Yes, we will now go to the five-minute rule. Five minutes? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to uh, diverge a moment and thank Secretary Richardson for the – I dropped him a note earlier because I didn't know if I'd get time. Uh, I want to thank you for the assistance in Sacramento on the McClellan reactor. That project is a success and will continue to be so, and your participation has been noted and appreciated. Thank so, you. I want to uh, look briefly at electricity into the California market. Who among you is probably the most knowledgeable about Bureau of Reclamation electricity? <laughs> Chairman Hecker. I am, sir. All right, Mr. Hecker. <laughs> <laughs> if I understand correctly, about 10 percent let me back up. There, the, the federal government has two agencies that are significant generators of electricity. One is the Corps of Engineers, the other is the Bureau of Reclamation. That's correct, mostly in the Northwest. And about, well, you've got Bonneville and you've got Western Area Power Administration and all the others. Mm -hmm. But they use facilities that are controlled by the Corps or the Bureau. Correct. Okay. The question I have as it relates to California is there's the Sierra Nevada region and then there's the Desert Southwest region, both of which contain bureau and core projects that generate electricity into the grid for use in California and western states. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. About 10 percent of their total generation is used or, sh or routed to investor-owned utilities, 10 to 15 percent. The rest going to municipalities, uh, water districts and things of that nature. Is that accurate, 10 to 15 percent? I, I don't know the exact number, sir, but uh, um, uh, the certain entities in the West, public power entities, have preference power. They have right. first dibs on, on that production. Right. Well, I've looked at this here recently, and suffice it to say that uh, after you follow the preferential allocation of the power, about 10 to 15 percent comes to the public market. It's sold through uh, market-based rating and distributed accordingly. The question I have is that in June of this year, we had a severe shortage of electricity in California, the consequence of which was that San Diego's consumers, those who rely on San Diego Gas and Electric, just got hammered 
in terms of cost of electricity. Are you familiar with that situation? Yeah. Yes, it's actually been worse in August and then a little bit in September, but uh, June really hit San Francisco as well. Okay. I was going to get to August and September because I know on, on Monday of this week something happened that I want to come back to. I have, I have, Mr. Chairman, uh, a limited number of information about bureau projects and their power generation over the last five years, starting in 1996. And what I want to get to is that if these, if these companies, excuse me, if these facilities are generating power into the marketplace, the benefit of which to some degree accrues to the consumer in San Diego, then we ought to, in a period of significant price spikes, run those facilities flat out. I and mean, we ought to be providing as much electricity into those markets as possible to keep the price down. Would that be a reasonable assumption? Yes, within, within respectable reserve margins, that's probably appropriate. A respectable reserve margin would be what, 5 percent, 10 percent? Well, it's, it's changed over time. We used to think uh, reserve margins of 15 or 20 percent were appropriate, and, and in this market, uh, it's well below 10 percent. Okay. And that, and that ties into stage one, stage two, stage three alerts, and how you figure out where the blackouts and brownouts go and all that sort of stuff. Well, the point that I want to bring up is that we have the Hoover Dam in the desert southwest region, which is running I would say over the past five years, pretty much close to capacity. We have the Davis power plant, same thing. We have the Parker power plant, same thing. The Deer Creek power plant, these are all in the desert southwest region of the Bureau's <coughs> operations, same thing. The Elephant Butte plant, same thing. The Navajo plant, same thing. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands of megawatts of aggregate electric generation. What I'm curious about is why, when we have such severe electric shortages, we aren't running Glen Canyon flat out. We're running Glen Canyon roughly at 50 percent of capacity in the June, July, and probably August time frame. And I don't understand that. Who made that decision and why? Um, that's information I don't have, sir. I, uh, uh, Bureau of Reclamation or the Corps may have it, but I don't. I'd like to enter this into the record, Mr. Chairman. Just Without objection. And perhaps copies can give. Uh, give I, I do record. know that in the West this year, generally, it's been a bad water year, and a lot of uh, major hydro facilities have not run near their historic capacity. I, I would, I would probably concur with you, and that's why I check the others. I mean, Navajo, granted, is a coal largely coal-fired, but these others are, in fact, hydro plants, and there is no significant yeah. vari variance in their production levels. So I checked that hypothesis, because I particularly the, was concerned about that. The, the gentleman's time has expired. We'll get back to you. Thank you, Mr. Have Chairman. Have uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to yield my five minutes to Mr. Tierney. Oh, Mr. Tierney. I thank you, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Richardson, I yesterday had an opportunity to question a gentleman from ExxonMobil. Uh, about whether or not, in fact, his company had reduced production over the course of last year by some 30 percent, because that's what had been reported. And, in fact, he acknowledged that they had. And it's been reported that not only that company, but a number of other of our own domestic producers, so-called big oil, uh, have been cutting our production. So that I would assume that it's not just OPEC and non-OPEC foreign uh, oil-producing entities that are not producing as much as we would like. We have a problem here at home. I then asked him whether or not they had made great profits. And I think uh, it's interesting to note that, in fact, the oil industry has experienced significant benefits from increases in oil and gasoline prices. The 10 largest oil companies reported tremendous increases in profits in the second quarter of 2000. Overall, those 10 companies reported second quarter profits of $11.1 billion, a 182% increase compared to the second quarter of 1999. In the first and second quarters of 2000, total profits for these 10 companies were $20.8 billion, exceeding the total annual profits for all of 1999. Second quarter 2000 profits for ExxonMobil was $4.5 billion, a 276 percent increase from second quarter profits in 1999. From Chevron, their profits were increased 219 percent. For Conoco, it was 300 percent. Phillips Petroleum was 550 percent. Sunoco was 727 percent. 
Exxon, Chevron, and Conoco all reported record profits in the second quarter of 2000. Stock prices for these oil companies have obviously increased significantly. The average stock price for the 10 largest oil companies has increased 14 percent. Companies with the largest increase in stock prices were Phillips Petroleum, 43 percent, Tosco, 23 percent, Ultramar, Diamond, Shamrock, 20 percent. And in addition to oil companies, other companies have benefited from the increase in oil prices as well. For example, Halliburton, the world's leading provider of oil field services, saw its stock price increase by 34 percent from January 1 to September 15, 2000. All this, Mr. Secretary, while they're reducing production. My question to you, sir, is the administration dealing with these domestic oil producers, as well as with OPEC and non-OPEC foreign suppliers, to make sure that they are producing at the rates they should be to keep our prices down and our fuel stocks available? Congressman, I have had numerous meetings with uh, oil companies, big and small, urging them to increase production, urging them to get more product into the market, asking them uh, what specifically can we can do to help with their transportation and access and uh, regulations to just get more uh, reserve into the market, home heating oil, uh, every possible product. Without trying to defend the actions of anybody, I do want to point out that a lot of these uh, a lot of these decisions they make on production, they're, you know, they're basically business decisions. Um, I think their profits show that. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, their, their profit, uh, y you can't compel them to increase production. You can urge them. You can jawbone them. We've done that. Uh, I think most have. Uh, you've pointed well, out I some. I appreciate your answer. My, my point is, and I, and I think you've been good at pointing that out, you're being very diplomatic, as is your, your bent. But the fact of the matter is, while we hammer away at OPEC and others, we've got a problem right here at home from the big free marketers who don't want any government involvement, uh, but they're not exactly doing things that would help this country in a time of crisis, and I think that's important to note. Uh, Ms. Browner, uh, we talked about refineries, and, and there hasn't been a refinery built in the northeast area for that 25-year period because the companies haven't applied. Does EPA have any regulations dealing with storage facilities? Mm -hmm. For the bulk storage facilities exactly. and the underground storage tanks? Yes, absolutely. Can you tell me whether or not there have been any applications to increase the storage capacity in the new northeastern area in the last recent period of time? Um, we should answer that for the record. I, I, we, we think there probably has been. We're not aware of how much, so we'll answer that for the record. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, Northeast Reserve that's being planned, and I know that there are two sites in New Haven, Connecticut, and one in Woodbridge, New Jersey. Uh, common concern, I know the answer to this, but I'd like to hear you put it on the record. Common concern from people is, will that uh, reserve, because it's located in Connecticut and New Jersey, actually be beneficial to Massachusetts and points north if, in fact, it becomes necessary to use it, and how will it get there and so forth? Uh, Congressman, it's for the northeast. Your area will be protected. Uh, we're working out all those contingencies right now. The progress on setting up the reserve uh, is going well. Right. And lastly, the, the storage or suppliers, people involved with that, have been saying that they have a problem with what they call carry. In other words, if the price is higher in January than it is right now, uh, all again, these are free market people who want the government to stay out of it, but they're, they're saying now they have a problem and what they really need is an incentive. So the government, they would like to come in and write them a check or give them a tax break to help them on that carry. Uh, while I can understand and appreciate that and I'm really amused by their change in tone as to what they think the role of government is here, uh, would it not be somewhat more reasonable or fairer to the taxpayer if we gave them a low interest loan of some sort, or a revolving loan process? And do you think that's worth doing? Do you think that's part of the solutions to help them through this carry period? And is that a reasonable way to approach it? Yeah, I, I think lo uh, loans, and we've tried to put them uh, in touch with the Small Business Administration. A lot of these uh, home heating oil operators, as you know, Congressman, because I attended a meeting in your district, you did, and Mr. Mazur did, who's here, and I want to acknowledge he and Mr. Shages for the great help that they were in those Did hearings. they do okay? All right. <laughs> <laughs> they do great. I think ways to, to, to incentivize them are, are not harmful. Now, we have not accepted the concept of a tax rate. It is being considered a small tax, tax rate to get them, for instance, to, to, to store more, uh, to keep more in their stocks. They've not done so, and I, I, I think at that meeting they explained why. They said uh, prices are so high, if we stock, uh, all of a sudden there'll be price volatility and we're out of business, and we don't want to do that. 
So I think a tax credit, modest, triggered, may uh, be something that we're considering. Loans, certainly, uh, government loans, this is through the SBA, uh, are, are something that, uh, that we partially have, but perhaps could expand. Uh, I just don't think, uh, Congressman, that these small home heating oil operators have been the villains in this whole process. No, and I, I think yeah, well, I'm talking about the people that store it. You know, the, the, the suppliers, and they're not so small in a lot of cases, and they're looking to have their carry covered. And I don't mind trying to get resolved that problem, but I just want to make the point: these are the people that want government off their back. We're happy to get involved in the right amount of government intervention, but perhaps a loan program might be better for the taxpayer than a, than a giveaway. The gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Latoura. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yesterday, uh, Mr. Secretary, we had the. Uh, the oil companies were here, and uh, a chart that I'm going to ask the, the staff to put up in, uh, in just a minute. I think they represented it was from Sitco, who wasn't at the hearing yesterday. But I made the observation that when I uh, learned to drive, we had high test and regular gasoline, I guess. Now, those were your choices. This map from Sitco was uh, designed to illustrate all of the different blends of fuel that may be required to be stored in different parts of the country to comply with various regulations. I, you talked about. Um, jawboning and working with the oil companies on issues of transportation. One, one problem that they talk about uh, is the fact that uh, when we get to the winter driving season, you need this many blends of gasoline, the summer driving season, this many blends of gasoline. I just had a, a company in my district uh, called Lubrizol came in and they want to pitch Mr. Perciuseppe in a couple of weeks on a new product that they're making called Purinox that they claim that it reduces uh, NOx emissions by 30 percent in particulate from diesel. And I said, this is great, means jobs, a lot of money for where I'm from. But if they were, and they were going to go out to Mr. Waxman's state, they said, we're going to go pitch it to California too because they have some air quality regulations that some of the rest of us don't have. That's my state, not Mr. Waxman's. Well, it's Mr. O.C. and Mr. Waxman's <laughs> state and, and many other people as well uh, live in California. Uh, but, but maybe, and maybe this is both for both the uh, Administrator Brownie and, and, and you, uh, Mr. Secretary, don't, don't we, maybe can't we solve some of our infrastructure problems if we go back to the notion that whatever gasoline you decide, Mrs. Browner, or, or your successor su decides is the best for the environment uh, during the winter and summer, that we go to that rather than having these 50, 60, I think there's 29 different blends yeah. of gasoline, if I understand it right. And which, whichever one of you wants to, to <laughs> the, jump in. The Secretary in is telling me it's my area. Um, we don't disagree with you. Um, I think that part of the challenge is you need to separate on, out on this map those that are local, that EPA has absolutely nothing right. to do. And as you well know, a lot of cities, for a variety of reasons, have uh, decided to kind of set their own gasoline recipe, uh, Detroit being one of the older ones. But there's a number of those up there. And when you talk about the 26 different blends, a number, a large number of those actually are, in fact, uh, local city uh, decisions. Uh, you know. I'll make a suggestion. I don't suppose it will be popular with all, but you want, you could go to one clean gasoline standard for the entire country. I mean, part of the issue occurs because uh, for reformulated gasoline, which is about a third of the country versus conventional gasoline. Right. You do have issues in terms of reformulated gasoline depending on where it's sold in the country uh, in terms of weather and volatility. I mean, you could fix that by going to one clean gasoline recipe for the country. Right. Uh, what that would mean, though, is you would have places who don't necessarily need it to clean their air uh, buying it, and that would be objectionable, I don't doubt, to some. Yeah, but, but you know, I, I, don't, I don't think the air, my air doesn't stop at the border of Ohio and Pennsylvania, right. and it, mm -hmm. it goes all over the country, and those of us in Ohio are blamed by those in the Northeast for polluting their air, and we blame the folks in Wisconsin. And So I, I, it seems to me that, that the argument that was made by the oil companies mm -hmm. that part of the problems with spikes and delivery is we have all these boutique gasolines and they got to swab out the pipelines and the tanks and everything else could be minimized if we went to one brand. Let me... Mr. Latourette, I do think sure. it's important to understand it is Congress that named the cities that would get the right. cleaner gasoline. It was not the Environmental Protection Agency. It was Congress. So we would require a change in the Clean Air Act. Okay. And, and, and that, that brings me to my, my next point. When you were here in June, I, I want to talk about the cities of Chicago, St. Louis, and Milwaukee. Uh, and, and when we, again, had the oil companies here yesterday, uh, they made, uh, I suspect, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't agree with me, but I suspect that they got caught taking a gamble in June. They saw that you had granted an enforcement mm -hmm. discretion uh, for St. Louis, and I think that they gambled that uh, it would, you would follow suit in Chicago and Milwaukee, and they lost. 
Uh, well, there was no basis for them taking that gamble. They don't use the same pipeline. Ma ma you know, the issues were different. Maybe not, but but since that time, and the question I have of you is, uh, have you had a chance to, to look at what the, uh, the Congressional Resource Service uh, concluded relative to the legality, uh, the statutory legality that was used to grant a uh, discretion uh, whatever it was called, it was a pipeline, uh, yeah. enforcement discretion for St. Mm -hmm. Louis mm -hmm. and deny for Milwaukee. And have you had a chance to look at that or your folks yeah. have looked at that? Um, I'm the actually, and maybe there's two different um, Congressional Research Service uh, memos. The one I've seen is, and it may be the same one that you're referring to, looked at Midwest gas prices. I don't know that it looked at the legality of uh, the situation in St. Louis versus the other cities. I'm not familiar with that. But I will tell you why we did it for St. Louis. Well, well, St. Louis had a me, pipeline me, go down. I, I, I know down. they did. The Explorer pipeline in St. Louis got 70 percent of their gas from it. And I, right. I, I just want to, uh, if you could, I, I'm looking at the memorandum of June the 28th, 2000. Okay. And if you haven't seen that, if, no, if I have I could, not seen if, that. If, I've if seen the June 16th. Okay. If I could ask you, uh, and or your staff to review it and Certainly. respond to the committee in writing as to their conclusion mm -hmm. that the enforcement discretion exercised for St. Louis, Missouri was in violation of uh, 80 CFR uh, 80.73 uh, and that not granting it for Chicago and Milwaukee when requested um, was also we suspect. And so any, any thoughts that you have on that would We'd be, be happy um, to take a look at that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. Well, yes, well, <laughs> Mr. Sh Mr. Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to focus, as did Mr. Kucinich, who I appreciate has allowed me to, uh, to go first, and you, Mr. Chairman, as well, um, on natural gas. We face a, a real crisis of cost in Illinois. Um, I showed this, uh, this chart, yes, this uh, actually bill insert that I got in July in my bill from NICOR that showed that we should expect that what we paid for $410 worth of gas last winter, we could expect to pay $610 this winter. That was in July. We understand that the October prediction is going to be $750. From $410 to $750, this is going to pose an enormous problem to not just poor families, but to ordinary working families in my district and in the service area of this utility company. Um, I have some basic questions about natural gas pricing, considering we're talking about a 100 percent domestic market. And why have the spot well held, held, wellhead prices doubled? I don't understand that. Let me just let me just ask my questions. Why did production drop when the demand increase was predictable and predicted? Does the uh, cost of natural gas track oil prices, regardless of supply and demand? Is there any relationship at all between the cost of production and the cost to consumers? And I have to tell you, uh, Mr. Hacker, Hacker, when I read your testimony, I was concerned about a rather complacent attitude that I felt was expressed in that, um, that you said that uh, consumers are still saving money on natural gas compared to pre-competitive prices, that you say the Commission will be monitoring the gas supply and price situation very closely this winter to assure that competitive pipeline, pipeline transportation markets continue to work in the public interest. I don't think we can explain to my constituents and consumers in our area that any of this is operating in the public interest. They're going to be wondering how the heck they're going to pay their gas bills, particularly when they look at the profits of the, the gas companies, the fact that it is entirely domestic. And I thought that maybe you could clarify this and hopefully reflect some of the urgency that I feel and I think that many of my constituents feel. Well, and your, your question's a great question, and it's one that... Uh, that uh, sort of tracks the sentiment that we heard in California two weeks ago when we were there uh, on electricity prices. Uh, we're very aware uh, that this country uh, runs on electric and natural gas, that we need uh, reasonably priced and stably priced uh, supplies of energy. No question about that. What, what I am uh, um, uh, hopefully getting across is that uh, the the commodity itself, natural gas, has been decontrolled. 
uh, and there are lots of explanations as to why uh, the price has varied this year compared to previous years. And I know that's not very satisfactory to American energy consumers. Uh, what the FERC can do about that is to encourage our colleagues at the state level who are in charge of rate stabilization and, uh, and lie heap and, uh, and in terms of ensuring that their utilities make prudent uh, natural gas uh, purchases. Uh, to exercise their authority uh, with respect to retail rates. Uh, and what we can do is to ensure that that, when I say the inter interstate natural gas pipeline market, I mean exactly that. The, the, the part of the, the piece of the pie that we regulate is, are, is the interstate uh, pipeline system that takes the gas from the producer uh, or the processor and delivers it to the city gate to uh, to the Washington gas lights of the world that distribute it. Well, maybe Secretary Richardson then can deal with the uh, larger question just of natural gas prices if you're only dealing with the pipeline. <laughs> Congresswoman, I'm sorry. I, I was trying to have a conversation. Why, I think it's a similar question to why, why are, were, was production so low when we knew that there were, we were going to have a, a problem and now prices are so high that we have a crisis? Demand is high. That's uh, is my number call. one. Number two, U.S. gas production has been relatively flat. That's the second reason gas storage levels have been below normal and basically alternative fuel markets have been very tight. So I think you have those four problems and uh, the price issue, the capacity issue. Now we are, the President will sometime very soon announce some initiatives uh, from his interagency task force on natural gas. Uh, we, as I said, Congresswoman, have a proposal before the Congress on what is called delayed uh, geological expensing, which will enable the natural gas producers to, to drill more and have an incentive to drill more. Uh, we also have up here uh, infrastructure improvements for pipelines. You know, there have been several pipelines that have burst that we need to find ways to repair them, to get them functional to get them operational, and that is an initiative that we need to deal with, too. But those are the basically four reasons why we have this spike in prices. We look, we look forward to an announcement by the administration. Thank you, the President. The, the gentleman's Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Richardson uh, has stayed about an hour and 15 minutes over what he had uh, originally was supposed to stay, and I, I just wondered well, we, we, uh, how, how will the chair proceed here? Well, uh, after just talking to you, there's two more people that have questions for him. I think Mr. Sanford and myself. And I, don't, I about, don't have any further questions. That'll be about 10 minutes, so if you can stay 10 minutes, we should have you out of here, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> in the Do I get chair, to go, too? <laughs> well, we have a few more questions for you. If you don't mind staying for maybe another 25 or 30 minutes, we should have everybody out of here. But uh, I know he has to leave, so if we can get you through in 10 minutes, that'll and then we'll try to get you out of here right away as well. Mr. Stanford. Uh, I thank the chairman, and I apologize for the delay, Bill. Um, I, I, I guess I have just a couple questions um, for both of you all. Uh, in that it was interesting, uh, the gentleman for, for Vermont, I think, raised a very interesting point, and that is we have an administration that uh, has said it, it advocates the rules-based system that comes with WTO. We have a trade representative who's constantly arguing that very point, and yet we haven't seen a lot of activity from the standpoint of doing something about to, uh, o, you know, OPEC members and the cartel that they hold. Um, and so I would simply ask you as Secretary of Energy, uh, I mean, ha have you lodged a formal complaint with the WTO based on the uh, the the cartel that's held by OPEC. No, and I wouldn't do so, Congressman. That would not be helpful. I don't think that uh, it constitutes a WTO mm -hmm. violation. 
So a cartel held by OPEC going colluding on prices does not constitute a, a breach of the rules-based system as outlined by WTO? Our view is what is desirable is the free flow of oil based on market forces. That, that is our position. Now, well, that's a wish list, though, in that that obviously doesn't exist given what OPEC's doing. Well, as I said before, OPEC, the last three meetings they've held, they've taken decisions that like are positive for the international community, more production. Uh, we encourage them to do more because those are the signals that are coming from this country and from the world. I, I prefer to maintain a, a, a dialogue with them rather than fighting them in courts. Okay, so no action taken on WTO. How about encouraging to our administration to eliminate the no-fly zone over uh, Iraq? Why would we want to do that? Okay, no. How about elimination of military sales to those OPEC members um, uh, uh, based on the fact that they're colluding on, on, on prices of fuels coming back to the United States? We, the United States, have a lot of strategic interests in the Gulf, including the containment of Iraq. Uh, we have strong relationships, security relationships with Saudi Arabia, with Kuwait. That would not be in our interest. So you, that would be an action that you would not be willing to take? No. Um, and similarly, if not uh, a case in the courts through WTO, how about some kind of uh, revoking of, of the, the normalized trade relations that they now enjoy with our country? Fall in the same category? Same category. Okay. I, I don't mean to be harsh on this, but I, I think it's my, my point is that we're unwilling as an administration to ask these things of a foreign country, in this case, a group of foreign countries colluding on oil prices to America's detriment, while at the same time, the remedy that you're offering in one part suggests uh, invading the, the strategic oil reserve. To me, that doesn't make sense. In other words, we'll put our own military at risk by bleeding down the strategic oil reserve, but we won't ask this of a foreign country. The President will decide in the next few days what to do uh, on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, this uh, use of the reserve has been, as you know, extremely limited. Uh, it's, it's a very important decision, but it's uh, a few days away. It is based on whether the president believes uh, the American consumer, the home heating oil crisis, uh, the American consumer would be harmed, and he will not hesitate to take the, the steps that are needed. Uh, so, Congressman, we have been very, very judicious in the use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. There was enormous pressure to use it all year, and we have it. I understand that, and I respect that, but, but my, my concern is we've been even more judicious in asking allies in the Middle East to do certain things than to use our own strategic oil reserve, which is, I thought, there for a very specific reason, and that is to be there in the place of military contingency. Congressman, we asked Saudi Arabia to increase production. They did. We asked OPEC countries to increase production. They did. That, that is good not just for the United States, but for world markets. Now, that doesn't mean we should rely on their imported oil or their activities. But they are a reality. They control a large uh, supply of the world's oil. Uh, many of those countries we have strong relationships with, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Indonesia, Nigeria, United Arab Emirates, uh, Qatar. We, we have strong well, relationships. I understand. I understand. There's some that we don't. We don't sure. talk to them. Iran, Iraq, right. Libya. You know, we don't talk to them much, so. Right. Um, uh, so I, well, gentlemen, time, time has time. expired. Uh, I had some more zinger questions, though. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. I apologize. Let me just uh, take my five minutes uh, and let you get on your way, uh, Mr. Secretary. You just alluded to the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, Lawrence Summers and Mr. Greenspan uh, oppose using that. And, of course, the Vice President today called for releasing uh, fuel from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, you said the President would be making a decision on that. Uh, do you have any opinion you're going to express to him? Mr. Chairman, any, any advice I give the President is, is confidential. You, you know that. 
I would like to say that Secretary Summers and I share the same view that the use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is very selective, uh, that it has to be under the right circumstances. Um, I think our views are, are fairly similar, and they have been. I, I, I saw that article. Uh, the, admit, the President has a wide range of options, uh, including some of those that uh, the Vice President proposed. And a decision on, on whether to use the reserve is, will be made shortly in a few days. Uh, that, that's all I can say. My advice to the President is based on the fact on whether we believe that the administration, uh, that the, we believe the American people would be harmed by, for instance, the home heating oil shortage, uh, whether uh, the high energy prices I just had. The well, consumers I, and truckers and a lot of people talk to me. There's there's well, I, serious problems that I think you've answered answered our question and, and I understand the concern that you have for the American people and their heating oil problems, but I, I guess you know after two days of hearings and listening to the people who testified yesterday, there's a divergence of opinion on where the problem lies. The energy producers say there's environmental regulations that are strangling them. There's not enough pipeline capacity. Uh, there, there's a whole host of things that they said which has been refuted or disagreed with today. But it, here, here's what it appears to me. I don't know if it appears to my colleagues, but to me, it appears to me that there really is no strategy for dealing with the natural gas problems. We've got in, 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 in our forests out west, uh, we have a lot of government-owned land where there's great natural gas reserves. Which could, which could be very efficiently pumped out of the ground at higher levels than what they're getting in the pipeline now, but we're not exploring them. So th there doesn't appear to be a strategy for natural gas. There doesn't appear to be a strategy for the problems that the reformulated gasoline and, and the many varieties of fuels that are having to be made are causing. There appears to be no strategy for increasing our domestic production of oil. I mean, we keep talking about dependency on foreign oil. We have oil that can be pumped out of the ground in various parts of the country uh, environmentally safely that we're not uh, going after. And we and, continue and to, on let, that, Let me just go through all these, then you can respond. Okay. And, 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 and so we're not reducing our dependence on foreign oil. There's no strategy for speeding up the process of getting permits for electric power plants, according to the people yesterday. I mean, uh, the, the comments were that the transmission lines is taking up to seven years. And uh, I won't go into all that again, but you can respond to that. And, and there seems to be only a patchwork strategy for dealing with our home heating oil problems, such as the strategic oil reserve or the, the new storage facilities you're talking about. So, I mean, it's frustrating to me when we have a hearing to hear one thing from the industries and another thing from the government, and then we as congressmen and senators when we try to put all this together and decide what we can do to help, we get some, some suggestions from you that are limited to legislation that's pending before the Congress, some of which is being held up by people in the other party. And, and, and we say, what can we do to help the American people? So I'd like for you just to respond to that, if you would. Well, Congressman, I, I wasn't at your hearing, but, but I've heard these complaints before. I think what we need is, is we need action. You need to pass a number of initiatives that some of these industry people uh, even advocate. Let me start out with one. Uh, the industry has wanted oil and gas credits for marginal wells. The President has proposed that. We're for that. The Congress hasn't passed that. Uh, we've proposed tax credits for energy efficiency, uh, more funding for alternative sources of energy, as I said, uh, boosting our own people. We've, pro we've proposed uh, electricity deregulation, which most utilities in the country want. Uh, you know, for, for, for there to be whining uh, and, and blaming the government, I think is just, uh, is just wrong. I think what you as the Congress needs to do, and I say it respectfully as somebody that was with you for 14 years, is sort out uh, the different points of view, but, but look at the facts. And the fact is that uh, the, president, the President's initiatives on a wide variety of supply and demand energy policies have not been passed. And well, you can't blame us uh, for not having a policy when 
when a lot of it, like elemental, the, the, the reauthorization of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, this Northeast Home Heating Oil Reserve, it, it is not passed. It's not approved. And, and this winter, there's going to be a spike in gas and oil prices. Uh, diesel fuel is up. The truckers around the country are screaming to high heaven, and it's going to evidently get worse with the new EPA requirements, at least this is what we're being told. And so all I can say is that I hope that, uh, well, I, 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 I hope that we can. Uh, the gentleman yield. No, I won't. You're going to just continue to, to misstate what we've been listening to all afternoon, or at least give Ms. Browner an opportunity to once you again had, set the record you straight? You had seven minutes. Now, your time. And sir, you've start. had more than ample time no, also, but you're using it to create a misstatement of the order. facts. And you're so out, aren't you, sir. You're, you're out of order. I'm the chairman of the committee. Now, just. That doesn't give you a license, sir, to go out there and misstate the facts or to go on and on beyond your time. Either please give her the time regular, to answer regular. you and set the facts straight or we, stop. We are going to give Ms. Browner the, uh, the time to answer. Mr. Secretary Richardson is under time constraints, and I was making a comment within the seven minutes, which you had, which is more than the five, and uh, you interrupted me. Now, what I was saying to the Secretary is that I hope that we can reach some kind of agreement so that those spikes in oil and gas prices this winter will not make a, a life unbearable for a large segment of our population. And I want to thank you very much for staying beyond the time that uh, you said you could, and we really appreciate your, your being with us. And now I will yield to uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Richardson, thank you. And um, I want to thank, again, the other members of the panel. Uh, in listening to this exchange today, a few things have become obvious. Uh, with Secretary Richardson's leadership, uh, we asked OPEC to increase production, and they did. Uh, the United States asked nine of OPEC nations to increase production, they did. Uh, the United States asked domestic producers to increase production, and they've decreased production. And, as some of them have added, while they're decreasing production, they're saying, well, the problem's, uh, you know, clean air rigs. Um, domestic producers have decreased productions and their profits going through the roof, which means when they come back to the market with that oil, they're going to make even more money. Um, here's one member of Congress who objects to that. And I would, I would hope that uh, the administration uh, knows that they have another tool at their disposal if these domestic oil companies do not respond. And that tool is price controls. Now, I know that's a heresy in a free market economy. But as Mr. Hacker said earlier, I mean, there are limits to what a free market can do. You know, free market is wonderful, but if people can't afford to get to work in their cars or they can't afford to heat their homes, uh, then we have to ask some questions about the free market. We don't just go keep going back to the people and telling them to pay more. That's not fair. Now, Mr. Hecker stated that natural gas supplies for immediate consumption are short. Uh, how many months has, uh, has FERC known about this shortage, Mr. Hecker? Well, the, the shortage, as you put it, is a shortfall in, in winter storage, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, have been watching it, uh, within, and it's largely within historic uh, tolerances. Um, right now, the uh, gas uh, storage for the nation generally is at around 71 percent full, uh, which is down about 10 percent from last year. Uh, the experts that I've consulted uh, tell me that that's going to pick up uh, dramatically uh, in the next few weeks. Well, uh, Mr. Secretary had stated that uh, production is flat. I'm asking you if FERC has investigated the possibility that natural gas companies are underproducing natural gas to drive up corporate profits, because that's what it seems the oil companies are doing. Well, I, I can tell you that, that, that based on our understanding of the market, uh, gas producers shut in their wells and, uh, and, and basically went home. A lot of people left the business be, at a time when natural gas at the wellhead was being priced at $1.60. Uh, 
Uh, the market wasn't there for them. They, they quit producing. Uh, uh, and uh, now we're living with the consequences of that. Um, are they, are they continue, continuing to underproduce, at least on the gas side? And a lot of these folks are the same folks that produce oil domestically. Uh, uh, the rig count has doubled just in the last few months. So they're back out there again. Uh, the, the difficulty is uh, that the supply response is going to lag um, 12 or 14 months uh, until it hits the market. When it does that, prices will come back down. I would also say that the Wait, price... Excuse me, though. Sure. I mean, you, you assume prices are going to come back down. I assume. I assume. I have to. I have to mention again that we don't rec we don't regulate the commodity, but this is what this is what I have uh, have found out because I am as concerned as you are, sir, about the price. Of natural what can gas. you do when the when these gas companies are are pricing three times what they've uh, priced before, and, and why and why why is the supply response so slow? What well, can you do? What can we do? We can make sure that the interstate pipeline market is, is uh, equipped to deliver uh, those supplies as soon as they come back online. And we have a very good, very efficient, very adaptable uh, interstate pipeline system uh, that's uh, very competitive. Right now, the, the, uh, the gas purchasers in, uh, in your hometown uh, can buy from uh, different suppliers, uh, from different basins. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very workable system. They can hedge, they can uh, engage in financial uh, uh, instruments to protect themselves against risk. You regulate interstate rates, right? Interstate transportation rates. Right. You, you, you regulate those? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you do anything about that, about the price of the interstate rates? You monitor them. We think the, the price of interstate transportation is, is regulated and we have rate cases all the time. And, and, and uh, could, we, could we, for instance, uh, cap those rates or drive them down arbitrarily? Our statutes require us to do investigations and make those decisions based on costs and, and the Final record. question, will you investigate? We'll look at them. Yes, Thank sir. Thank you. Thank you. We uh, are just about near the end here. Uh, we'll yield uh, to the people who are remaining and then let our guests go home, uh, Mr. Uh, when do I get to say what I'm Oh, see. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back to the electrical markets with Mr. Hecker, if I could. <coughs> I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> this is a map, and it's difficult to read, but obviously it's a map. This is a map of southwest United States. And you can see there, you have the desert southwest region, you have the Sierra Nevada region, you have the Rocky Mountain region, and you have the Upper uh, Upper Plains region. If you look in the desert southwest region, you'll see a number of plants, which I highlighted earlier, those being Elephant Butte, Deer Creek, Parker, Davis, uh, Hoover, and Navajo. And with the exception of Navajo, those are primarily hydro facilities. I want to go back to my central point here, and that is that these are facilities that are under the control of the Bureau of Reclamation which is one of the largest electric generators in the country, just by virtue of having all these facilities. And the thing I specifically want to reference is that in July, June and July of this year, compared to June and July of last year, you'll note that a significant reduction in the generation from Glen Canyon has occurred. And that corresponds almost exactly with the electric spike, price spiking in southwestern California around San Diego. So the issue is, why did the Bureau of Reclamation, which is an agency of the Interior Department, reduce by over half the electric generation out of Glen Canyon in the face of severe price dislocations in San Diego? Uh, again, uh, it's information I don't know. I suspect it's because of the supply of water. Uh, well, but, I, but in all my hearings uh, in, in California and investigations about California, um, the withholding of generation capacity from out of state, uh, the deliberate withholding, is something that, frankly, no one else has brought up. Well, I, I just want to put to rest the, the supply of water issue because I checked that. 
along the Colorado River, which is where Glen Canyon is, where Hoover is, all along that Colorado River basin, there was no reduction at Hoover. There was no reduction at these other plants up and down the Colorado in terms of, no, I mean, 2 or 3%, but not 50%. So my question comes back, why did the administration allow a 50% reduction in the generating capacity at Glen Canyon in the face of severe price dislocations in San Diego? Well, with all due respect, that's something you'll have to ask the administration. Okay. Well, I, just, I want to go back. I, I know the answer. I just wondered if anybody else did. There was a law passed in 1991, PL 102575, which the gentleman from New Mexico actually voted for, which directed the Department of Interior to engage in some work along the Glen Canyon stretch, the purpose of which would be to analyze the impact on the environment of low flow uh, releases from Glen Canyon. And it's very interesting because it's, it's actually a very, very appropriate use of government authority to investigate this. And in the, in the interest of protecting the consumer, the legislation gives the secretary in conditions of, let me find the exact words, the secretary may deviate upon a finding that deviation is necessary and in the public interest to respond to hydrologic extremes or power system operation emergencies. Now, I suspect that what happened in San Diego qualifies under a power system operation emergency. There was no hydrologic extreme. So what we had was legislation passed by this Congress, supported by Mr. Richardson, by Mr. Waxman and others, that said analyze this, but keep in mind that if we have price dislocations in our markets that we serve, you have the ability to waive the requirement and jack up the generating capacity. Those circumstances came to pass, and this administration ignored them. And in fact, for the first time on Monday of this week, they actually did grant a waiver. And in fact, the generation at Glen Canyon did go up in respond to significant increases in demand in California. I want to know why in June, July, and August, we don't have the August number here, but I can guarantee you it's going to be similar to the 200 and odd thousand there. Why in June, July, and August, this administration sacrificed the interests of electric ratepayers in San Diego when they had the freedom to answer the call for electric generation demand? Well, you have me at a loss. I, I don't know the answer to that. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. I'll well, if you can, if you could get uh, that information for us, it would be very helpful. I will ask the, the Department record. of Interior to help provide. We'll get that to Ms. Rossi. Mr. Chairman, first, uh, I'd like to submit for the record three documents. Uh, the first is a statement from the uh, automakers uh, calling for cleaner, uh, clean diesel rule. Uh, second is a press release from the uh, Engine Manufacturers Association. And the third are comments from the state and local air pollution administrators. Uh, each of these groups support the EPA low sulfur diesel rule. Without, a, without objection. Thank you. Um, Ms. Browner, I, uh, I was uh, listening when I, what I thought was a mischaracterization of the, um, what the testimony that we've heard today in terms of EPA's role in, in this situation. And I'd like to give you just a moment or two to sort of recap for us and set the record straight for the third or fourth time so that maybe we don't have to hear it again. Uh, thank you very, very much. First of all, with respect to permitting delays, you heard testimony apparently yesterday about all sorts of delays up to seven years. That is not because of any action by the Environmental Protection Agency. We do not cite transmission lines. We do not permit transmission lines. If you actually look at the numbers, and we will provide all of the details to you, and you're free to come and look at all of our records, we are moving electric generating permits through the system in cooperation with the states on a 12 to 18 month basis. Whatever delays are, they are not because of the Environmental Protection Agency. Secondly, I think it is important, and I thank the Congressman for noting uh, the support we do have on our proposal. But we have not adopted a diesel standard yet. And for people to be talking about what this will do before we have made any final decision strikes me as somewhat premature. Secondly, our proposal would require these clean diesel fuels in 2006, not tomorrow, not next year, but almost, what, six, six, five and a half years from today. 
third, we are working with those in the industry who will work with us, as we did on low sulfur conventional gasoline, to incorporate a whole host of flexibilities. I would note that on our low sulfur gasoline rule, this affects almost every refinery in the country. We get sued regularly at EPA by environmental groups, by businesses for the decisions we make. We were sued by one small refinery on that rule. Not all of them, one, and we are looking to resolve that issue. I think that is an indication of how well we worked with the industry to both meet the public health standards and provide the flexibilities. Um, there are other issues, Mr. Chairman, that, that you have mentioned that I still would like the opportunity to uh, clarify. I know you want to have an accurate record. For example, you made reference early on uh, to the dyes and, and, and some other uh, issues, and I, I don't want to use uh, the kind gentleman's time, but hopefully I will be able to uh, share that with you before the hearing ends. Thank you. I think somebody referred to it as corporate whining, and I, I probably wouldn't be that strong in the wording, except to say that I think a lot of times businesses, because that's their job to make a profit, they do these preemptive mm -hmm. strikes and, and trying to do something that uh, they don't want to do. Uh, Mr. Hecht, uh, Hecker, uh, you mentioned during the course of your testimony that, um, that you could no longer affect the amount of uh, gas that was in the supply or whatever because it had been decontrolled. Was there a time when there was some control of government regulation on the supply of gas? There was. Between uh, 1954 and uh, in the late 1970s when the Natural Gas Policy Act was passed and for some period after that because price controls were phased out. And if we had that law still in effect today, would there have been some remedial action that could have been taken to avoid uh, what we've just gone through, a period of really depletion of supplies and now a lag period waiting for it to build back up? Well, ironically, when that law was effect, in effect, the, the, the consequence of it was to, uh, uh, was to uh, uh, create a chronic short supply in the country. Uh, we had price controls uh, uh, at a point when production was continuing to decline. Uh, our reserve picture was very bleak in the, in the late 70s. Uh, we didn't allow natural gas to be used for boiler fuel uses, that is for electric generation or industrial purposes. We didn't allow natural gas to be used for a variety of, of things and we were curtailing supplies uh, because we thought it was a very, very limited resource. Um, when the price of natural gas was decontrolled, uh, what we found is that we had an ample supply and people went out looking for it and, uh, and I think I can say with confidence uh, that the industry uh, expects natural gas supplies to be uh, durable for the next uh, half century if not a whole century. Yet we still find ourselves in a situation that though we have plenty of it, we can't seem to get it when we need it. Well, what happens is that when you create a market, uh, you live with some of the vicissitudes of that market. And uh, when, uh, 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 to use the words of the CEO of Anadarko yesterday when I was at the conference in Ohio, he said, the real energy crisis was when natural gas was at $1.60 and oil was at $10 a barrel. For them, that's true because they just got out of the business. They, a lot of small producers especially uh, quit producing. Um, that is uh, an unfortunate situation because uh, 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 cheap energy does two things. Number one, it, uh, it diminishes production and it also disincents American consumers from being efficient and, being, and conserving their energy resources. Gentleman's time Thank has, you both. Gentleman's time has expired. Let me just say, uh, before I yield to my colleague, uh, that that's one of the reasons why you need a long-term energy policy. Because if you have these wide fluctuations in the price of spot price of oil or gas, you have to have a long-term policy that sets some kind of consistency. And we don't have that. I yield to my colleague, Mr. Latourette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Hecker, uh, Congressman Kucinich, who was here earlier, and I come from the same part of the country, and uh, the banner headline of today's Cleveland Plain Dealer was that uh, people in uh, Greater Cleveland are going to pay $70 a month more uh, this winter for their natural gas bills as we heat our homes going into the winter. And I, I've listened very carefully to your responses to everybody that's asked you questions about it. I want to talk about pipelines, which I think are within the, the purview of your, uh, of your organization. And uh, Do we have, uh, if the producers were, were finding it economically feasible to produce, do we have sufficient pipeline capacity today 
uh, to, to meet the needs, particularly in the northeast part of the country? I believe we do. I, I think we're moving in the right direction. The, uh, the Commission has uh, certificated uh, 8,000 miles of interstate natural gas pipeline since 1995. Uh, that represents uh, a, a delivery capacity of about uh, 17 uh, uh, million uh, cubic feet a day, and, and um, uh, or 7 billion cubic feet a day. And, and uh, uh, as the demand for natural gas increases, we expect to get requests for, uh, for more interstate pipeline capacity. Uh, but we have certificated uh, uh, some major facilities uh, in an environment where uh, landowner objections and, uh, and environmental problems are, uh, are very important and, very, and those folks are very vocal. Uh, and we have to take that, uh, that into account. Uh, even pipelines that we have certificated for the Northeast um, are not being built at their original design capacity because the project owners have not been able to find a market for some of that original proposal. Uh, what that tells me is that we're doing it just about right, and um, uh, that, that means that we're going to continue to consider applications for more capacity, uh, but that we're not going to do it at such a rate that we're going to create a capacity glut, which is going to cost consumers a lot of money. You talked a little bit earlier about the natural gas folks having the ability to hedge. Are you familiar with the, the term interruptible contract? I am. Could, could you explain just for the, the committee's record what that is and how those work? Well, an interruptible contract uh, uh, for, for pipeline transportation simply means that you buy at a lower rate and, you're, and you uh, take the risk of being curtailed at some point if supplies are short or if capacity is short. The, the, uh, in all markets that are volatile, uh, folks use things like hedging and futures to, to stabilize prices. Are those tools available to the natural gas industry? They're very available in the natural gas industry, yes. Are, are there any disincentives that you're aware of, uh, governmental tax or otherwise, that uh, prevent or, or inhibit the natural gas folks from becoming involved in, in uh, hedging or futures to stabilize the price of natural gas? The, the natural gas folks, by that you mean? The producers. The producers, no, I'm not aware of any. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any more questions. I would just ask uh, unanimous consent that the uh, CRS uh, report that I was chatting with Administrator Browner about of June the 28th, 2000, be included for the record. Ms. Browner, I've made a copy for you, too, Great. so Thank that you, you can take that with you. And Certainly. if somebody wants the balance of my time, I'm happy to yield it to them, or I'll shut up and yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Osi from California, who shares California with Mr. Waxman, as we all recall, <laughs> um, apparently uh, I'd be happy to yield the balance of my time to you. Thank you, Mr. La Tourette. The folks from Ohio have always been generous, and I appreciate it. So, uh, Ms. Bronner, do you do you uh, do you think we need more generating facilities in Calif electrical generating facilities in California? I don't. I, I would not want to pretend to be an expert um, on this well, based issue. On the, based on our I mean, based on experience. what I've I, I, I've read and what I have heard, um, I certainly think that is a, a, a question that's worthy of very serious consideration. But I in no way are, would want to, to I, I am not an expert on issues like that. I can certainly talk to you about if you want to have more generation, what might be some of the cleaner um, types of generating mm -hmm. uh, facilities, but I am not an expert on the demand side. Mr. Chairman, I see my yellow, Mr. La Tourette's yellow light has come on. <laughs> we'll come back to the cleaner generating <laughs> facilities on my next round. Thank you. Another round. Uh, thank the chairman. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, first, let me just check off the, the list. I got a bizarre question I've always wanted to ask you, and that is um, uh, you, the parent, uh, you know, Al Gore's book, Earth in the Balance, and all that sort of thing. There's been so much talk about basically minor portion of that book that dealt with. You know, if you increase the tax on uh, fossil fuels, you could basically do more to clean up the environment than anything else you could do out there. Agree, disagree, where are you on that? I think the, uh, the work, and I'm sure the Vice President would agree with this, of cleaning up the environment uh, requires a wide array of activities and tools, and that this administration has been doing its level best within the authorities granted us to uh, do just that. 
But you'd agree it'd be one of the tools? I did not say I agreed or disagreed. Well, I'm asking you to pick one. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Touche. But um, the, uh, I mean, that's what these exchanges are all about, though, is trying to get to the bottom line of... I I'm of, not in charge of, of those policies. Can. Again, I am but really happy to talk to you about clean air. Well, that's what we're talking about, though. I mean, the well, argument was you. that if you increase the, the <laughs> tax on fossil fuels, you could do more to clean clean air than anything else you could do out there. And I'm I'll tell you, everything we're that. doing to clean the air, your citizens and all the citizens of this country. Well, I'm sure you're doing many different things, <laughs> but I'm asking your specific thought on that one thing. I'm doing everything I can within the authorities Congress has granted me. So you just don't want to answer the question. I'm not I, I'm answering it within uh, the area well, I understand of my, you choose not to answer, uh, but I was just sir, asking for your opinion. Sir, I have an area opinion. of expertise, and I am more than happy to speak to my area of expertise. I have the utmost respect for our vice president. He has Certainly. been at the forefront of virtually every public health environmental uh, issue in this country uh, for I as long as that. I can certainly remember. I was simply remember. asking your opinion mm -hmm. on that part of the book, and you're saying you choose not to answer. Fair enough. Uh, second question. Supply and demand. Um, Economics 101 would say, all right, uh, you know, supply and is in part controlled by regulations around that supply. In other words, that's the, th the funnel through which supply reaches in product. And, um, uh, you know, there are all kinds of unintended consequences that go with any piece of regulation. Since that piece of regulation is out of bounds in terms of your willingness to answer it, I would ask, there is no regulation of that sort at the I, EPA. There's not. Again, but okay. we're, li we're going there right now, which is, if you think about the different pieces of regulations that have been promulgated mm -hmm. by the EPA, some have had, had good consequences mm -hmm. in terms of raising or lowering fuel prices. Some have had bad consequences. And I'm asking you to do the David Letterman routine, which is give me the top two that you think have raised fuel prices the most and the, and the, and the bottom two that have lowered fuel prices the most. Can I suggest that these are complex issues? They don't lend themselves, with all due respect, to a David Letterman routine. I am happy to talk about the cost and the benefits. Okay, we could take David Letterman out, but I would just ask if you, if you pick one make. or two that, that, that had some very positive consequences. I'll cleaner and gasoline, without a doubt, cleaning up the nation's gasoline, removing things like toxics, benzene, sulfur are some of the most cost-effective things we can do to improve air quality and to protect the public's health, to reduce respiratory illness, to, produce, to reduce premature death, to uh, reduce asthma attacks in our children. They are, without a doubt, some of the most cost-effective things that we can do. Now, I said in my opening statement, and I'm happy to say again, I am the first to recognize that when we move forward to protect the public's health, to protect our environment, there are costs, but they are pennies compared to the benefits that clean air is bringing the people of this country. And there is study after study, and I'm not just talking about EPA's sure. study. There are studies after studies that and have documented, and, and, and as one all. member I noted earlier, the, the, but, but the, the I, most fascinating. I, I, I would I would go in the in that I only have five minutes, uh, and we're down to about a minute left. Um, if you were to pick out one thing, though, wherein there was an unintended consequence of EPA that resulted in higher costs to the consumer, what would that one thing be, from the standpoint of fuel price? I'll give you an example. Uh, actually, outside of the clean air program, I'll give you the example of brownfields. Uh, without a doubt, uh, when this Congress adopted the uh, Superfund legislation almost 16 years ago, uh, an unintended consequence of that legislation were the brownfields uh, sites, the sites, the, the lightly contaminated sites uh, that the developers, the bankers, the lenders, the cities wouldn't come to address. Now, fortunately, uh, we've had a program to try and solve that. We need Congress to give us some uh, legislation, but without a doubt, and, and I don't dispute your premise that there can be both sure. positive and unintended consequences. I think that is a, 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 a clear 
example of it. One of the things we did, and Mr. Chairman, if I might have a, a little bit of extra time here, because I think this is an important uh, issue, and I'm sure the committee does too. Uh, when we were setting the new tailpipe emission standards for cars and SUVs and the fuel standards that get you what actually comes out of the tailpipe, it's the catalytic converter, it's the engine, it's the gas you put in that gets you the actual air quality benefits that you breathe, we spent a lot of time, I personally spent a lot of time uh, with both industries that would be affected, asking them how we could avoid unintended consequences. And I'll give you an example of an unintended consequence uh, that I believe uh, has, in fact, been avoided. Detroit told us over and over again that they are about to have a clean diesel engine for cars. They've got it in Europe. They can bring it here. It could be two to three times more fuel efficient. But we had to structure our standards to allow for that clean diesel engine. And we did that. And they have said that repeatedly, that we set up the program to meet the public health benefits. We didn't change anything we asked for on public health, but we avoided a consequence of keeping those engines out. Now, if we're going to bring those engines in, we had to do that last year. This year, we have to get them the clean diesel gasoline, and that's the second piece of it. But we do look at both the intended consequences and the unintended consequences. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, before I yield my time, and go ahead and start the clock, before I yield my time to Mr. Rossi, let me just say that uh, uh, we're going to give you whatever time you need to respond to anything that we've talked about Great. Uh, Thank earlier. You. Uh, but you made the point that uh, they have only received one application for a new refinery at the EPA in the last 25 years suggesting that the lack of refinery capacity is industry's fault. Uh, it's so unprofitable to build a refinery in this country that there really isn't much point in submitting an application because of the requirements. And you can respond to this after Mr. Rossi finishes. This was, uh, I believe, a misleading statement. And there's no strategy for dealing with the fact that refineries are strained to the breaking point and they would like to expand and or build new ones. Well, I'll let well, you respond after I, Mr. Rossi. Well, let me, Mr. because I'm going to yield my time, then you can respond as, as you wish. Mr. Rossi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Browner, I want to I want to go back to, uh, we started to just discuss briefly the air quality issue mm -hmm. and what the um, particulate matter discharge would be from any given facility. In my district, in Sutter County of California, we're under construction on a gas-fired turbine. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the projected generating capacity being somewhere around 400 or 500 yeah, megawatts. Mm -hmm. The issue there is that the nitrous, nitri <laughs> nitrous oxide mm -hmm. emissions on that plant will be about one twelfth right. of the gener or the emissions from oh, a cool. plant mm -hmm. of similar capacity elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the challenge that I see, and I want to, I really want to talk about the prevent. Prevention of Significant Deterioration Program. Mm -hmm. Because the challenge I see is that if we're, going to, if we're going to encourage industry to create these plants that are so much more positive on a relative scale mm -hmm. for the environment mm -hmm. and that can provide peak or swing power for mm -hmm. our economy, one of the things it seems to me we need to do is bring some certainty to that process mm -hmm. on the PSDs. Now, in this, in this particular plant's case, it went through local jurisdictional review. The Board of Supervisors there passed on us. it. Right. There was an environmental document. Everything mm -hmm. was real clean, simple, mm -hmm. done. And then the current, the current PSD process allowed a window after that local review for someone to file an appeal. Mm -hmm. And the result of that was that an individual who lived a, roughly 100 miles mm -hmm. away came, filed an appeal over the if I recall correctly, the air quality impacts. Right. Mm -hmm. And it cost four months immediately. In other words, there was an immediate shutdown of construction. The yeah. appeal was eventually denied on the basis of, you know, lack of factual basis. Well, I think of the basis of standing. The, uh, the complaint okay, was found okay. to have no standing. Uh, right. Well, the issue that I have is how is it possible for us to take the PSD appeal process and correlate it to the appeal process in California law under CEQA. So you, so you don't have that extension, if you will. Like you have the CEQA appeal process mm -hmm. right now, then you have the PSD mm -hmm. appeal process. Is it possible for us to take the PSD process 
and yeah. correlate it mm -hmm. to the CEQA process. About half, half the states have done that, and we are fully supportive of that. California has not chosen to do that. L let me back up for a second, because I think this is where some of the confusion that may exist between what people said yesterday. Um, all but one state now handles air permitting for all facilities. It is not EPA in the first instance. They use the federal authority, but they handle the day-to-day -day permitting process, application, review, and granting. For the one state, we do it. We also do it for Puerto Rico. About half of the states have chosen to handle any appeals that may come as a result of a permitting decision. Half have not. If they choose not to, then we are required to handle the appeals process. Can I ask your indulgence? My time sure. is about to expire, and I want to go to one other question. Well, and, and then the I think chairman, the, I the, chair, the chairman's going to allow time you to I respond. Need it. So. <laughs> the, the other issue well, that I excuse me, with all due respect, you, you've made some statements that I think would benefit from an explanation. And I'm willing. I'm willing to sit, and I want, I'm very. Well, I'd like to do response. it on the record in public because this is an this is a statement about an agency that I run, and I, I feel like they're not. We don't have the full story. And I'm just I'm just looking for what can we do legislatively to try and well, correlate those. One possibility, as I've already pointed out, is that half of the states handle the appeals process. California has chosen not to. Okay. Let and me we're happy to work with them on doing it. Mr. Chairman, I really feel strongly about setting something straight here. My, my only other question was... Well, the chairman said I could. <laughs> We're not going to stop the clock on you. Uh, yeah, but I'm going, to be, I'm going to be sitting here alone. I can no, see you're what's not. coming. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here. <laughs> Mr. Tierney's going to stay with me. I will commit to staying because well, we'll uh, I'm interested in your answer. We'll finish well, so she can answer. Okay, Thank my, you. My other question was that we have a choice of whether to import oil from foreign trading partners or increase production somewhere, somehow, here domestically. And the question that I have is that on a relative scale in terms of environmental consequence, are we better off importing oil where we don't have the various air quality protections from foreign sources, or are we better off, from an environmental standpoint, producing more oil here domestically subject to all of our regulations? Yeah. And it, it's a hype. It's yeah. obviously I, I, a I think that is. I think that's, I think that's a legitimate expired, question. We'll let her answer all I think these that, is, that is a complicated. Um, question, and I think that it, it, it is complicated by many factors. For example, the whole issue of greenhouse gases. That is a global problem. It doesn't really matter where the greenhouse gas comes from. Uh, we all are, will experience the consequences of the warming or the changing of uh, the Earth's climate. So if you analyze it from that perspective, uh, my attitude would be you need environmental protections in all places to ensure that you're not contributing to an increase in uh, greenhouse gases. I, I, I think it's, it's hard to answer that absolutely. You know, I do believe uh, that all of the work that we can do, that we do with other agencies to, if you will, uh, upgrade uh, upward harmonization of environmental standards uh, globally are of a benefit uh, to all of us. I, you know, I, I, I think it's, it, we need, my sense is when you look at our oil supply, we need a mix, uh, domestic. Uh, and uh, foreign. Uh, my sense is that there's a lot more we can do from a domestic perspective in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of renewables. We've got a bill up here uh, in terms of renewables uh, in the gasoline, uh, which would help our farmers, uh, which would help our cities who pick up all those yard clippings. They can turn it into biomass and become part of a renewable fuels program. So I think it's a combination of activities. If, if I might just return to the, I think, the specific permit uh, that you brought up. Start to finish, it was 13 months from the time the final application was submitted. A couple of points to note. First of all, twice the company changed their application. They themselves changed what they were looking for. And that does result, obviously, in additional review. They made the changes. We weren't even involved at that point. Uh, the state was. EPA very quickly looked at what the state had done and concurred. A appeals was filed. California doesn't handle those, so it came to us. Our entire time for the appeal through our Environmental Appeals Board was 11 weeks. That is hardly, well, I'm happy to give you the dates that things were received, but I'd like to point out something. In the Appeals Board, we appear as a party. We don't appear, we don't appear as the party filing the appeal. In this case, we appeared in support of the company against the party 
filing the appeal. Now, I think these are important facts that have not been stated as far as I can see from yesterday's record. It's simply the EPA stood in the way. We didn't stand in the way. We came in on the side of the company. We think these facilities are good facilities. We have been supportive of them. And I hardly think a 13-month permitting process where the company themselves made adjustments is an unreasonable permitting process. Now, I can't speak to what local government requirements may be. I can't speak to what PSC requirements or whatever you call your uh, state regulatory, what is it, a PSC out there? That's Mr. Waxman's PUC number. I, I can't speak <laughs> to any of that, but I can speak to what we do. And I would like the record to reflect that in the case of the Clean Air Act requirements, it was a 13-month process. And that is I, I can name a lot of facilities in your state. Uh, we have another one that was a 14-month process. We have another one that was a 14-month. We have one that was a 16-month. I mean, this one was 13. I would also like to point out there are not many appeals to the Environmental Appeals Board. Right now, I think we have three pending for electric turbines. Uh, one was resolved, I think, in 10 days. Uh, one was resolved in uh, three and a half months, and one is about to be resolved. People do have rights. They should be able to raise questions if they believe a mistake was made. We move expeditiously, and when we have an opinion, we come in on the side of the company. Is it, my question was, is it possible to correlate the appeal period under EPA with the appeal period under CEQA? Excuse me. That's, Why doesn't the state, if the state would take over the appeals process, well, they would, it's their appeals process. They could incorporate whatever the federal appeals process would require, I would think. The, 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 they the, could put it into theirs. They've chosen not to. I don't know why California made that decision, but that's a decision they made. And we'd be happy to talk to them about excuse it. Excuse me. Let me just say the gentleman's time has expired. If we have more questions, any of us, for Ms. Brown or, or Mr. Hecker, all we have to do is write them, and I'm sure they'll respond. We'll ask them to respond for the record. And as I said, Ms. Brown, if you have further things you'd like to clarify, we'll be happy to listen. I, I would. I would like to spend... Um, a moment uh, clarifying uh, one other point. You've been most kind to allow me the time, and you put up some bottles earlier uh, with some uh, dyes in them and suggested this was silly uh, requirements on the part of, I don't know, IRS, somebody, probably us. Um, let me explain why these dye requirements exist. These are not interchangeable fuels. One of these fuels has only 500 parts per million sulfur. The other is in excess of 3,000, maybe higher. America's truckers don't want that 3,000 parts per million sulfur fuel, home heating, off-road fuel in their trucks. That is what the die is for. It is also for the IRS to make sure they're collecting the right taxes. And I know we all agree that collecting the right taxes, not overcharging, not undercharging. But surely we also agree that protecting the trucker and the public's health, that's what the dies are for. So when someone is moving the product around, they know are they dealing with a high sulfur content or a low sulfur content. Now, I also understand that there were some complaints about this means you have to drain a tank, you know, Obviously, people have residuals in their tanks when they bring in a new fuel. Surely, that's not the problem. I, 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 Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I cannot for the life of me understand why anyone who's involved in this business would think that dying two radically different fuels, they are not slightly different, they are radically different fuels, is a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Browner and Mr. Hecker. We really appreciate it. Uh, you've been very helpful, and I appreciate uh, your being kind with your time. Thank we, you. We stand adjourned. That was wonderful. That was fun.
Here's our midnight lineup. Coming up, a campaign stop with Democratic presidential candidate Al Gore.